Good evening. I want to welcome you all to this evening's debate. In the words of Dr. Bart Ehrman, Jesus is the most important historical figure in the history of the West. The primary sources we have for Jesus are the four Gospels found in the New Testament. And many people today think these documents are historically reliable. Many don't. But I think we should keep in mind what the French writer Joseph Joubert once said, it is better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. And the question we ask this evening is, are the Gospels historically reliable? You as the audience have the pleasure of sitting back and witnessing this question being debated between two top historians who specialize on the topic at hand. I'm grateful you have chosen to come to this debate in your pursuit of truth, so thank you for coming. My name is Jonathan Mann. I'm the student president of Ratio Christi here at Kennesaw State University. Ratio Christi is a student organization that evaluates the truth claims of Christianity through examining the evidence. We host weekly meetings where we have guest lecturers or open discussions every week at 7.30 p.m. in the Social Sciences Building, room 3028. And everyone is welcome to attend and engage in the discussion. We are honored to co-host this debate with the KSU History Club. This is a student organization that provides students with the opportunity to attend history-related events such as visiting local museums, historical sites, and hosting group research projects. This group also connects students with professors from the history department and aids students in building their resumes for graduate school. So we would like to, I would like to thank the KSU History Club for all of their support in making this event happen. I would like to thank the Kennesaw State University College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Student Activities Budget Advisory Committee for their generous support in making this event possible. I would also like to thank Ratio Christie at KSU Director Duke Hale, Faculty Advisor Dr. Victor Marshall, and the student officers for all of their efforts in making this event happen, Vice President Eric Matson, Secretary and Reservation Delegate Zach Bohannon, Treasurer Keaton Brumley, and the Marketing Officers Gracie Ernest and McLean Henry. Finally, I would like to thank this evening's moderator, Dr. Brian Swain, and the debaters for being willing to participate in this debate, Dr. Bart Ehrman and Dr. Michael Lacona. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Brian Swain. Dr. Swain is a historian of the ancient Mediterranean world. Here at KSU, he teaches courses on the Greek, Roman, and medieval pasts, and on pre-modern history more broadly. Dr. Swain received his doctoral training in Greek and Roman history at The Ohio State University and he is a specialist in late antiquity, 300 to 700 AD. And I, I have had the pleasure of having him as my professor for a number of classes here, and I could attest, I could personally attest that he is one of the best that KSU has to offer. Please welcome Dr. Brian Swain. Good evening, friends and welcome to Kennesaw State University and to tonight's exciting debate. I'm Brian Swain, uh, professor of ancient Greek and Roman history here at Kennesaw State University, and I'm honored to have been asked to be tonight's moderator. I would like to thank the student organizations Ratio Christi and the KSU History Club for hosting this event, and special thanks to two students in particular, Jonathan Mann and Eric Matson, who have shown such savvy and determination in planning this event. Thank you very, very much indeed. I wish also to thank Dean Robin Dorf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and thanks also to SABAC, the Student Activities Committee. I applaud SABAC for their support and encourage them to continue to support intellectually focused events like these. They are a service to our students, they are a service to our community, and as we'll see, they're just flat out fun and delightful. I would like to introduce the topic of this evening's debate by describing first what it's not about. This is not a debate about whether or not God exists. It is not about the divinity or salvific role of Jesus Christ. It is not even specifically about the truth of Christianity as a religion. Now, to be sure, tonight's program has implications for those questions, but tonight's topic is something more technical. You might even say wonkish. It is about how we responsibly read ancient texts. It is about the criteria for reliability. And I'll repeat that. The criteria for reliability that historians place on writings that were composed a long time ago. 
So how do we know when we can trust something that was written that long ago? Well, girls and boys, that's a tough thing to know. And to demonstrate how tough that is to know, indulge me for a moment while I present to you the following hypothetical scenario. Imagine our world 2,000 years from now. There have been a few more world wars, environmental catastrophes, societies have collapsed, and so did much of the records of those societies. But humans, the tenacious creatures that we are, we rebuild society, and eventually some people even become interested in reconstructing the history of the ancient United States. Now, one of these historians happens to discover a collection of 10, 20, 100, no, 500 different copies of the ancient text called the National Enquirer. <laughs> now, after painstaking and rigorous examination of these tomes of wisdom, our historian concludes, quote, you know, this Elvis guy was not nearly as dead as everybody thought he was. <laughs> now, you can, you can sympathize with the historian's predicament. Records are few and fragmented. You don't have much to go on, and suddenly you find a whole bunch of ancient texts that all pretty much say the same thing. Is that enough to trust? Alternatively, let's take the same future scenario and another historian of ancient America who also discovers some old newspapers. Except these old newspapers say that in the early 21st century, Americans elected as their president a reality TV star with zero political experience. Now, now you can see why, you can see why our historian might find this claim to be dubious, and not because he dislikes reality TV, but because a reality TV star as president does not fit the pattern set by the other 44 presidents. So he concludes that perhaps this is just a tabloid. But anyway, all bad jokes aside, my point still stands. It's really, really hard to reconstruct ancient history from ancient records. Luckily, however, we have two esteemed experts with us here tonight to guide us. Therefore, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Lacona. Dr. Michael Lacona is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University. He is a New Testament scholar, Christian apologist, and director of the ministry Risen Jesus. He is the author of several books, including The Resurrection of Jesus and Why There Are Differences in the Gospels. His scholarly work is noteworthy for taking historical rather than theological approaches uh, to the questions of the resurrection and the differences among the Gospels. And if you would like to read Dr. Lacona's work, there will be book sales and book signings after our program. Dr. Lacona, thank you for being here. Dr. Bart Ehrman is James A. Gray Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Ehrman's work focuses on, among other subjects, the text and transmission of the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the history of early Christianity. He is the author or editor of over 30 books, five of which have been New York Times bestsellers, among them misquoting Jesus and how Jesus became God. In fact, Dr. Ehrman's latest book, the Triumph of Christianity, How a Forbidden Religion Swept the World, was released just about a week ago. So if you don't mind getting some wet ink on your fingers, it is available here tonight. Dr. Ehrman, welcome to Kennesaw State. <laughs> Two quick things and on to the big guys. Uh, we, we encourage everybody here to have a blast tonight. Have fun, laugh, applaud, but we would ask you to hold your applause until after each individual speech. In other words, please don't applaud and hoot and holler during the speeches. Um, and finally, if I can find mine, the cause of all of our joys and all of our woes, turn them off now, please. Uh, so at this time, I would like to invite Dr. Lacona to deliver his 20-minute opening statement. Dr. Lacona.
Well, good evening. And thank you, uh, Kennesaw State History Club and Ratio Christie for both sponsoring and hosting this evening's debate. And thank you, Jonathan Mann, for inviting me to participate. It's good to see Bart again. Um, Bart and I have some strong disagreements on a number of issues, and we've always had spirited debates. However, uh, we actually get along quite well. I like Bart and certainly consider him to be a friend, even though he's wrong. <laughs> Tonight's debate question is, are the Gospels historically reliable? Before we can get into this, we must first ask, uh, what is it we mean and define by the term historically reliable? Now, many events in ancient literature cannot be verified due to a lack of data. Moreover, the meta-narrative, such as we find in the Gospels, is beyond the reach of historians. The meta-narrative is that God has sent his uniquely divine son into the world to redeem it and has since returned to heaven from where someday in the future he's going to come to judge the world. Now, of course, that meta-narrative is incapable of being confirmed by historians. We simply don't have the tools to verify it. It doesn't mean it's false. It just means, as historians, we can't verify it. So what do we mean when we ask if the Gospels are historically reliable? Well, to start, it means that the Gospels get things right. But there's more to it than that when speaking of ancient history writing, since the finest ancient historians, Greek, Roman, and Jewish alike, were committed to accurate reporting and to writing good literature for the reader's benefit. And that often meant reporting in a manner that was less concerned with precision than modern historians have. Think about it this way. How many of you are married? Uh, quite a few of you. Well, you know, of course, what I mean then when I say there's the guy version of the story and the girl version. Now, I'm overgeneralizing here, but for the most part, women like details and lots of them. They want to know what happened, where it happened, when it happened, why it happened, who was there, what they were saying, what they were wearing, what they were thinking, how they were feeling, and then they want to know how you feel about it. Now, guys are different. We like bullet points. Get to the bottom line. When we tell a story to someone who, you know, we're relating that particular story, um, we may abbreviate the story, we may adapt it some and change some of the details a little. We're not trying to corrupt or pervert the truth. On the contrary, knowing what that other person is looking for, we're trying to communicate the truth with more clarity. Now, let me give you a couple of, of more examples. The first book written by my late friend, Nabil Qureshi, was a New, New York Times bestseller, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. It's an autobiography of Nabil's journey from Islam to Christianity. Bart may remember Nabil from a few years back when he was a student at uh, Duke. Here's what Nabil wrote in the introduction to his biography. By its very nature, a narrative biography must take certain liberties with the story it shares. Please do not expect camera-like accuracy. This is not the intent of this book. And to meet such a standard, it would have to be a 22-year-long video, most of which would bore even my mother to tears. The words I have in quotations are rough approximations. A few of the conversations represent multiple meetings condensed into one. In some instances, stories are displaced in the timeline to fit the topical character categorization. In other instances, people who were present in the conversation were left out of the narrative for the sake of clarity. All of these devices are normal for narrative biographies. Please read accordingly. Now that's biography written in modern times by a meticulous academic. Now let's go to antiquity. A man named Sallust commanded one of Caesar's legions and would become one of Rome's finest historians. Tacitus referred to Sallust as, quote, that most admirable Roman historian. The famous rhetorician Quintilian said Sallust was a greater historian than Livy and that, quote, one needs to be well advanced in one's studies in order to appreciate him properly. So it's noteworthy that Sallust occasionally displaced statements and speeches from their original context and transplanted them uh, in a different one in order to highlight the true intensity and even the true nature of those events. The finest ancient historians commonly used that technique called displacement 
and others. Now, in my view, that does not undermine the overall reliability of the literature, as long as we have the understanding that what we are reading was intended to communicate an accurate gist, or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. Ancient historical literature rarely ever intended to describe events with the precision of a legal transcript. In other words, it's often the guy version of the story with a lot more class. So here's the bottom line. Historians can speak of historical reliability in terms of specific stories and even in the broader sense of the entire biography. And it's this broader sense in which I'm interested this evening. So in what follows, I'll offer six criteria of reliability that provide confidence in the historical reliability of the Gospels in a general or broad sense. The first criterion is the author intended to write an accurate account. The majority of New Testament scholars now hold that the Gospels share much in common with the genre of ancient biography. From the Renaissance period to the present, much of our understanding of the ancient world derives from the biographies written by Plutarch. Now, of course, that's the real Plutarch and not the Plutarch in The Hunger Games. Ronald Meller of UCLA refers to Plutarch as, quote, the greatest of all ancient biographers. Plutarch told his readers that the biographies he was writing of people who had lived 800 to 1,000 years before his own time are not historically reliable because he had lacked good sources on which to rely. So he had to employ a lot of guesswork. Plutarch contrasts these biographies with those he had written of people who had lived within only 150 years of his own time. He says those biographies relied on better sources and could be trusted. Now, the Gospels were written within only 35 to 65 years of Jesus, and perhaps even earlier. When they were written, eyewitnesses of Jesus and those who had known them were still alive. So there was no need for the Gospel authors to employ the large scale of conjecturing in, present in Plutarch's biographies of much earlier times. Furthermore, the Gospels do not hesitate to report embarrassing details, such as Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him during his ministry and that he wasn't aware of the time when he would return to judge the world and others. Now, although their embarrassing nature is not so evident to modern readers, they would have been to the early Christians. Yet the Gospel authors chose not to omit them, suggesting their intent was to present accurate accounts of Jesus. The second criterion is the author used good judgment in his choice of sources. At least half of today's new, critical New Testament scholars agree with the early church tradition that Mark's primary source was Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples. A majority of critical scholars agree uh, that the primary sources for the Gospel of Luke and its sequel, the Book of Acts, included Mark's Gospel, people more directly acquainted with Jesus, an early source scholars call Q, short for the German word quella, meaning source, and Paul, with whom many believe he had traveled. A majority of critical scholars also agree that John's gospel was written either by an eyewitness or that an eyewitness was the author's primary source for much of the information in that gospel. So contrary to what the old form critics claimed, the Gospels are not a compilation of stories known by the Gospel authors only after those stories had been passed around carelessly, word of mouth, by a vast number of unknown individuals over the course of four decades or even longer. For at minimum, the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John are based on excellent sources who were either eyewitnesses or those not far removed from them. The third criterion is the author used good judgment in his use of those sources. Classicists believe Plutarch used only Dionysius of Halicarnassus as the source for his biography of the Roman general Coriolanus. So by comparing Plutarch's version with that of Coriolanus, we can decrypt what Plutarch did with his source when writing his biography of Coriolanus. We can do something similar with some of the Gospels. A near consensus of New Testament scholars hold that Mark was the first Gospel to have been written, 
and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source. So by carefully comparing how Matthew and Luke use Mark, we can decrypt what they did and were willing to do with their source. Sometimes they use Mark verbatim, sometimes they paraphrase him, sometimes they adapt him. But one one also considers other historians and biographers who wrote around the same time as the Gospels and compares how they used their sources, one is struck far more by the similarities between the Gospels than by their differences. For when Matthew and Luke use Mark as their source, they stay far more closely to their source than most other historians and biographers do with their sources. The fourth criterion is the author and his sources were capable of reporting accurately. A few years ago, my wife Debbie and I viewed the series Vietnam in HD. Those of you who saw the movie We Were Soldiers, starring Mel Gibson and Sam Elliott, will recall there was a combat reporter named Joe Galloway who was with Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore and his soldiers during the three-day Battle of Yadrang River Valley in November 1965. In the first episode of Vietnam in HD, the real Galloway teared up in an interview while talking about his experience during those days of battle, obviously still impacted by them even after 35 years. Then there was a 60-second clip of Galloway, I thought quite profound. Here's what he said. I left that landing zone X-ray battlefield knowing that young Americans had laid down their lives so that I might live. They had sacrificed themselves for me and their buddies. What I was learning was that there's some events that are so overwhelming that you can't simply be a witness. You can't be above it. You can't be neutral. You can't be untouched by it. Simple as that. You see it, you live it, you experience it, and it will be with you all of your days. Now ask yourself, if Jesus actually performed the events that are reported in the Gospels and you had been there, you saw him give sight to the blind, you saw him give hearing to a deaf person, you saw him take a paralyzed man, heal him so that he could walk again. You saw Jesus walk on water and raise the dead. And then you saw him crucified. And then shortly after, you saw him alive and in perfect health. Do you think that if you had experienced, had witnessed that, that that would have left an impact on you that was as deep and lasting as those three days of battle had on Joe Galloway? Well, that's Jesus' deeds. What about his teachings? Now, unlike modern pastors who have to prepare a new sermon every week, Jesus was an itinerant preacher. And so he was traveling and speaking to new audiences all the time. So perhaps he had a dozen or so sermons, and he preached these same sermons over and 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 over. And then he told his disciples who had heard him preach this, he said, now I want you guys to go out and preach the same things. And I send you out by twos. They could go out. They could correct one another. And so they went out and they taught the same things they had heard countless times. They taught it over and 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 over. And then they returned, and they, Jesus debriefed them, and then he showed them how to adapt some of those teachings. Hey, when you're speaking to a Gentile audience, you can tweak this parable a little bit from what you do with the Jewish audience, and so forth. And so he illustrated this, and he showed them again the same teachings over and 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 over. And then, of course, he's crucified, rises from the dead, commissions his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations, and now, for the next several decades, they preach the same things over and over, and you get the idea, right? Perhaps thousands of times. So Jesus' messages, his teachings, weren't something that he spoke of just once, and then his disciples had to recall decades later. And like any good teacher, 
Jesus taught in a way, he formulated these to make them memorable, so he taught in parables. He used rhetoric such as hyperbolic language to shock his listeners. Unless you hate all your family members, you can't be my disciple. If your right eye makes you sin, rip it out and throw it from you. We don't forget these things. Parable of the prodigal son, who forgets that, right? So the essence of Jesus' deeds and teachings could quite easily have been recalled accurately even decades later. The fifth criterion is we can verify numerous items reported. Many items in the Gospels reflect existing knowledge pertaining to the historical setting in which the Gospels are situated. Richard Baucom has shown that when ancient documents and inscriptions are considered, the names mentioned in the Gospels and the Book of Acts are not only common names of Palestinian Jews of that period and not those of Jews elsewhere, they also appear with roughly the same frequency in the Gospels and the Book of Acts that we find in extra-biblical sources. At the very minimum, this suggests all of the Gospel authors, or the sources from which they drew, were acquainted with Palestine around the time of Jesus. We also know that places mentioned in the Gospels actually existed. For example, Capernaum, uh, Nazareth, Bethlehem, um, Bethsaida, uh, Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. We know that several of the people mentioned in the Gospels actually existed in, during the period in which they're situated. Caesar Augustus, Tiberius Caesar, Quirinius, uh, the Herods, Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, Jesus, John the Baptist, James, the brother of Jesus. A number of items about Jesus reported in the Gospels are corroborated by non-Christian, unsympathetic sources, such as Josephus, Tacitus, Lucian, and Mar Bar Serapion. Most historians of Jesus employ a number of the criteria of authenticity. It is the item reported by an early source, by an eyewitness, by an unsympathetic source, by multiple independent sources. When these criteria and others are employed in reference to traditions about Jesus in the Gospels, there are numerous items about Jesus that nearly all scholars regard as being virtually certain. And finally, number six, no more than a very small percentage of items reported by an ancient author are known to be false. When we bracket theological claims in the Gospels, since they are outside the reach of historians, there are only a few historical items in the Gospels that are reasonably good candidates for being incorrect. For example, Luke's report of Augustus' census when Quirinius was governor of Syria the different genealogies in Matthew and Luke and the chronologies in their infancy narratives, three instances where the name of a person in the Old Testament is stated differently in the Gospels, a, new, a few occasions where Mark may be geographically confused, references to Christians being banished from the synagogue at a premature date in John, a few minor chronological items in the passion narratives in Mark and John, and the manner in which Judas died in Matthew and the book of Acts. Now, reasonable alternatives to error have been posited for many of these. However, even if we were to judge that every last one of them are outright errors, they are minor matters and make up only a very, very small percentage of the content in our four Gospels. Okay, I'll summarize and conclude. I'm proposing that we must think of historical reliability in view of the literary conventions in play at the time of writing. To say that a particular historical work in antiquity is historically reliable does not require reports to have accuracy with the precision of a legal transcript or that it be free of all error or any embellishment. Historically reliable means at the very minimum, the account provides an accurate gist or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. Think of Nabil's book and the guy version of a story. We've seen that we have good arguments, or good grounds for believing the Gospels are historically reliable in this sense because they meet this minimum standard. In fact, I think they go well beyond the minimum.
Well, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this event, uh, Brian, Jonathan, and others. I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming out. I'd like to thank uh, Mike. Uh, we, we've debated, what, three times? Four times? No, we include podcasts and stuff. This is... Yeah, okay, include podcasts. It's like been a multiple. So my, my favorite debate with Mike was, uh, I think it was our second one. Uh, he had laryngitis. <laughs> he literally couldn't speak. I destroyed him. <laughs> he couldn't answer a single one of my arguments. <laughs> All right, how many of you are students here? Good, okay. Uh, how many of you here consider yourselves to be Bible-believing Christians? Wow, okay, huh. Uh, how many of you are here to see me get creamed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I saw Mike raise his hand just then. So, uh. Okay, well, uh, look, this is a, it's a pleasure to be with you, and uh, this is a really uh, important topic. Uh, I thought this was an important topic since I was uh, 15 years old. So that's 47 years I've thought about this topic. When I started out uh, thinking seriously about the Bible, I was a Bible-believing Christian. I was a conservative evangelical. Um, I was uh, firmly committed to the idea that the Bible has no mistakes of any kind whatsoever. But I got to a point in my thinking where I thought, you know, if the Bible has no mistakes, there won't be mistakes. Are there mistakes? I opened my mind to just exploring it, not because I thought there were mistakes, but because I thought, well, if there, aren't, if there aren't mistakes, I won't find mistakes. And I started looking. This was a process that took several years uh, before I finally could bring myself to admit that I found something that I thought was a mistake. And then I started finding more and more and more. It ended up seriously affecting my faith. But I'm really glad that I did it because I think it's more important to believe what is true than to believe what you've been taught or what you've heard or what you want to believe. It's more important to follow the truth. In this debate, we're not really debating whether the Gospels of the New Testament were reliable by ancient standards. We're not asking how they compare to ancient historians, how they stack up against Plutarch or against Livy or against other authors from the ancient world. We're debating, are the Gospels, are his, are the Gospels historically reliable? I'm taking that question to mean something pretty basic. Do the Gospels describe what actually happened in the past accurately? If you read a book today, if you read a biography, you read a history, suppose you read a, st a study of Abraham Lincoln or Marco Polo, or Julius Caesar, and you ask yourself, is it accurate? What you mean is, you're not asking, is it accurate in comparison, like is it about as badly accurate as some other book written at the same time? You're asking, is it accurate? D does it describe the things that this person said and did, or are there mistakes in it? Uh, you're asking, with respect to the Gospels, do they actually describe what Jesus said and did? On this topic, there are some points on which Mike and I are certainly going to agree. We agree that the gospel writers were first century authors who were writing according to the conventions and style of their day, and that they had limitations that were imposed upon them by their day. We agree on that. We agree that there's some material in the gospels that is certainly historically reliable. There really was a Jesus. He was, he was probably baptized by John the Baptist. He had 12 followers. He, uh, he taught about the coming kingdom of God. He told parables. He had a trip to Jerusalem. He was, ex he was, he was arrested and put on trial and executed. We, and in broad terms, very, very broad terms, I agree that the Gospels are giving us some reliable information. But I don't think that the Gospels are accurate in many of the things that they say that Jesus taught and did and I'm going to try and demonstrate it to you. I'm going to try and demonstrate it to you. I don't have much time. Uh, I've, uh, I've got basically 15 minutes to try to do this, and it takes years, really, to see it. But I want you at least to listen to the evidence that I cite and think about it. I'm going to take three periods of Jesus' life, the, the very beginning, 
uh, the accounts of his birth, uh, something about his ministry, and then his, the accounts of his death and resurrection. So we start, we start with his birth. The, uh, the birth of Jesus is narrated in two of our Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Uh, nothing about his birth in the Gospel of Mark or in the Gospel of John. I'm going to focus first on the Gospel of Luke. Luke knows that Jesus was raised in the town of Nazareth, which is up in Galilee, the northern part of Israel, but he thinks that Jesus got born in Bethlehem, which of course is, is what most people think because they've, they've read the Gospel of Luke. Jesus gets born in Bethlehem. The question is, if his parents were from Nazareth, how, how, did, he, how did he get born in Bethlehem? Well, Luke tells us how. This is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. You can read this for yourself. In those days, the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. Okay, well, nobody thinks that the entire world is being enrolled for a census. Uh, people off in China were not uh, subservient to uh, Caesar Augustus. So let's just say the Roman Empire. Everybody has to enroll for the census. What's that got to do with Jesus being born in Bethlehem? Well, his his, his parents, Joseph and Mary, Joseph's not really his parent, but, but Joseph, Joseph is from the, the lineage of King David, we're told. He's from the house and, uh, and lineage of David. And David came from Bethlehem. And to register for the census, everybody has to go to their home of their ancestral, uh, of their ancestry. And since he's from David's family, David was from Bethlehem, he's got to go to Bethlehem. So they go to Bethlehem. And while they're there, Mary goes into labor and she gives birth in Bethlehem. We're told this happened when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. This is a hugely problematic passage, as Mike knows very well. Um, what does it mean that Joseph went to the home of David? David was the king of Israel who lived a thousand years before Joseph. Do you mean everybody in the Roman Empire is returning to their ancestral home from a thousand years earlier to register for a census? Whoa, how's that supposed to work? Suppose that the Democrats win this next election and they impose more taxes on us, which is likely, and when they do that, we have to register for a tax by going to our ancestral home. You have to go to the ancestral home where your ancestor came from a thousand years ago. Where are you going to go? And the entire country does this? And it's not mentioned in the newspapers? There is no reference to the census in any ancient source, period, apart from Luke and Christian authors who've read Luke. Why no reference to it, even though the reign of Caesar Augustus is well documented? Because it didn't happen. There was no census of the entire world where everybody had to register for, at their ancestral home. It didn't happen. Well, why does Luke say it happened? For a very simple reason. He knew that Jesus came from Nazareth, but he had to have him born in Bethlehem because that's where David was born. The Savior has to come. The Savior is the son of David. has to come from Bethlehem. The census didn't happen. Moreover, Luke says it happened when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Mike himself just told us, I'm not sure if you caught this part, Quirinius was the governor of Syria starting in the year 6 of the Common Era. King Herod died in the year 4 BCE. If Jesus was born under the reign of King Herod, he could not have been, the census could not have happened under Quirinius. There's a 10 year gap. Luke goes on to describe what happens after Jesus' birth. Mary goes into labor, she gives birth. We're told that uh, Jesus was circumcised eight days later. And then it came time for her purification, according to the law of Moses. This is a reference to a passage in Leviticus chapter 12. In Leviticus chapter 12, we're told that 32 days after a woman gives birth, she's supposed to perform a sacrifice for ritual purity. And so she performs the sacrifice, two turtle doves in the temple, and then we're told they went back to Nazareth. Okay, so they're just in town for a month. That's fine. But what do you do about, what's, about what is said in the Gospel of Matthew about Jesus' birth? 
In Matthew, what happens is Jesus is born in Bethlehem. These wise men come to worship him. King Herod finds out that the king of the Jews has been born in Bethlehem, and he sends out the troops in order to kill the child. The troops kill every boy two years and under. Joseph learns in a dream that the slaughter is coming, and he's told to go to Egypt. He and Mary and Jesus go, they flee to Egypt. And they stay there until King Herod dies, and then they come back and relocate to Nazareth. If Matthew's right that they fled to Egypt, how can Luke be right that they went back to Nazareth a month later? The chronology doesn't work. That's the birth of Jesus. Uh, we could say a lot more about the birth of Jesus, but I want to move on to his ministry. Uh, so, the ministry of Jesus. Of course, most of the Gospels deal with the ministry of Jesus. Mark begins with the ministry of Jesus, uh, begins with Jesus' baptism. Uh, Matthew and Luke, most of them about the ministry. The Gospel of John, most of them about the ministry. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of things. We could talk about the ministry. I just want to talk about one aspect, and it happens to be something that Mike brought up. The, the, the words of Jesus. Do we know what Jesus actually said? The most famous part of Jesus' teaching is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It is three chapters of Jesus talking. Three chapters. Matthew's gospel was probably written in the 80s of the Common Era. That is, uh, it sounds like that's the dating that Mike is going with when he said the Gospels were written between 40 and 65 years later. So probably 50, 55 years later is when Matthew's written. Matthew's writing a sermon that Jesus gave on this mount. He's writing this account 50 years after the sermon was given. How well can you remember Barack Obama's last State of the Union address from two years ago? Could you write it down two years ago? What if you waited 50 years? Could you write word for word what Barack Obama said in his speech? You were probably paying attention. I was paying attention, and I don't even know what he was talking about. The Gospel of John has a speech of Jesus that begins in chapter 13. He's giving it to his disciples, his last evening with them. Chapter 13, the speech goes into chapter 14, all of 14, goes through into all of chapter 15, and then all of chapter 16. And in chapter 17, he leaps into a prayer that goes all of chapter 17. It's five chapters written 65 years later. What is the likelihood that we know what Jesus said on this occasion? Now, Mike has just told us that the way the, the, the uh, gospel writers knew what was said is because Jesus said these things over and over and over and over. I'm not going to say how many overs that is because I don't have enough time, but uh, that over and over again. You will notice that he never pointed out whether that is ever said in the New Testament. Where in the New Testament does it ever say that Jesus gave the same sermon over and over and over and over and over and over again? It doesn't say anywhere. Where does he give the same speech over and over again in the New Testament? He never gives the same speech more than once in the New Testament. So why does Mike think that he did? Because Mike thinks he did. That's just like, well, that makes sense, so that must have been how it happened. But what's the evidence? Historians prefer evidence, and I don't know of any. There's certainly no evidence that he gave the Sermon on the Mount over and over and over and over again. It's given as a one-time speech. And he certainly didn't give his farewell discourse to his disciples over and over again. It was the last thing he said to them the night before he, the night he was arrested and then, uh, then sent to jail. Let me move to the end of Jesus' life, his death and resurrection. It is interesting that both the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John tell you exactly the day on which Jesus died. It was sometime around the Passover feast when Jews would uh, celebrate the Passover, the exodus from Egypt, by having a lamb slaughtered in the temple on the day of preparation for the Passover. You prepare the Passover meal, which involves eating, a, eating, uh, eating lamb that night. The, the lambs get slaughtered on the day of preparation, and that night is when the next day begins in Jewish reckoning. The next night, the night's the next day. When it gets dark, that's when the day begins in Jewish reckoning. So 
in, uh, in all, all the Gospels, Jesus dies sometime around there somewhere. In John's Gospel, John is clear. Jesus dies on the day that they are preparing to eat the Passover, the day before the Passover meal is eaten. Mark's Gospel is also explicit. Jesus dies the day after the Passover meal is eaten. You don't need to take my word for it. Look it up. Mark chapter 14, verse 12, and then Mark chapter 15, verse 25. It's the day after the meal was eaten. John chapter 19, verse 14. It was the day before the meal was eaten. They're explicit, both of them. But how can it be both? Now, you might say, look, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, he died sometime around there, fine. Okay, but it actually matters to John and it matters to Mark. It matters to John because John is our only gospel that says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is the only gospel that says that, and he has Jesus killed exactly when the lambs are being killed to show that he's the Lamb of God. It matters to him when Jesus died, and it matters for Mark that Jesus died the next day because for Mark, when Jesus gives his last supper, it's a Passover meal. So that the Christian, uh, the Lord's Supper, is a replacement of the Passover meal. It's important to both of them when Jesus died, but he dies on different days. They can't both be right. If you're asking, are the Gospels accurate? Well, one or both of them had to get it wrong because Jesus didn't, didn't get crucified two different times. He got crucified once. There are a number of uh, implausible things that you find in the, uh, in the gospel accounts of Jesus' death. The most famous one is in the gospel of Matthew. It's when Jesus is being crucified. We're told in Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 and following, that when Jesus was crucified, the curtain in the temple was torn in two, the earth shook, so there's this earthquake. The rocks were split. I've never known what that means, but the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These are the zombies of Matthew, the walking dead. Really? Uh, I think Mike's going to agree with me on this one. This did not happen. Are the Gospels accurate? Matthew says it happened. I don't think it happened. There are other problems with the Passion narratives. Let me just give you one more in my conclusion. Having to do with the resurrection narratives. Here's an exercise for you. You don't need to trust Mike when he says, uh, you know, that you can trust the Gospels. You can just read them yourself. And I'll tell you how to read them to see if they're accurate. Read one account of the resurrection, read, read Matthew's account, then list everything that happens, read Mark and list everything, then Luke, list everything, list John, list everything, list everything that happens and compare your lists. Do it yourself, think for yourself and figure it out. Are they accurate or not? Not if they contradict each other. In Matthew's account, when Jesus is raised from the dead, the women go to the tomb and they're told to go tell the disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. They are to tell the disciples to go to Galilee and meet Jesus there. The women go tell the disciples and the disciples go to Galilee and they meet Jesus there. And that's where Jesus gives his final instructions and the gospel ends. In the gospel of Luke... The women are not told to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. They're told to tell the disciples what Jesus told them when he was in Galilee, that he'd be raised. And Jesus then appears to the disciples and he tells them, do not leave the city Jerusalem. And they don't leave the city of Jerusalem. They see Jesus in Jerusalem and he says, stay there until the power comes upon you from on high. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. That's what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost 50 days later. And they don't leave the city. They're still in Jerusalem in Judea until the day of Pentecost 50 days later. After Jesus is raised, has ascended to heaven. 
well, if Luke is right that they stayed in Jerusalem, how can Matthew be right that they went to Galilee? They can't both be right. The Gospels can be shown to have contradictions and discrepancies and historical errors and mistakes. They do have. I'm not arguing that they are religiously uh, insignificant or that they shouldn't be read for theological reasons or that they should not be your books of faith. I'm arguing that they're not historically accurate. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bart. In my opening statement, I contended that we must assess historical literature in view of the literary conventions in play at the time of writing. In relation to ancient historical literature, I defined historically reliable as providing an accurate gist or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. Um, I then offered six criteria by which we may assess ancient historical literature and contended the Gospels meet all six. Therefore, the Gospels are historically reliable. I'd like now to review those six criteria in light of Bart's comments. The first criterion is the author intended to write an accurate account. And here I contended that the Gospels were written so close to the events that large-scale conjecturing by their authors was not required. Moreover, the Gospel authors chose not to omit embarrassing details which suggest that they intended to write accurate accounts. Now, Bart responded that, well, we're really not talking about uh, accuracy or reliability by ancient standards, we're talking by modern standards. Well, no, I'm talking about ancient standards, and here's, wh here's why. Let's say 200 years from now, our standards for writing history change. As one of my students said today um, in, a, in a class, he said, what if, you know, in the future, 200 years from now, we've got uh, software, uh, video that can assess what a person is their facial expressions and can tell what they're actually feeling and thinking at that time, stuff, of course, that we don't have today. Well, they might look and say, well, those people back in the early 21st century, they didn't write anything that was historically reliable. Well, of course, our, the standards 200 years from now may be different than they are right now but we would expect them to extend some charity to us because we were operating by our present standards. Our objectives are a little bit different. And in the same way, I think the ancients would appreciate if we extended some charity to them as well. In fact, modern biography as we know it today is only about 200 years old. Moreover, let me try to give you a little word picture of the different kinds of objectives and how they work. Um, Modern English translations, we've got plenty of them, English translations of the Bible, but they can be summarized in a number of different categories. Like, for example, we have literal translations like the New American Standard Bible that would, as best as possible, uh, they try to translate the Greek and Hebrew text into the English as close as possible, literally, as what those, uh, the Greek and English texts say. Then there are dynamic translations like the New International Version that are willing to sacrifice some degree of precision in order for clarity and for uh, readability. And then, of course, there are paraphrases, which there's no attempt whatsoever to get uh, precision in terms of what the word-for-word -word text said. Instead, the, the priority is readability and bringing out the gist, the essential faithful representation of what the Greek and Hebrew texts say behind them. Now those are different objectives in those translations, and it would be wrong for us to say that a paraphrase or the NIV is unreliable because it doesn't meet those standards for a literal translation when that is not the objective behind it. The ancients were trying to give us an accurate portrait of what, literary portrait of what that individual was. And sometimes they had to squeeze a lifetime, like remember what Nabil said, all these years down into something that could be read in a scroll in, in a three hour period. So it's not gonna be accurate in a precise sense, but the best ancient historians did it in a way where it was accurate in terms of the portrait. Now, the second criterion is the author used good judgment in his choice of sources. 
And here I argued that at least half to the majority of critical scholars think Mark, Luke, and John were authored either by an eyewitness or by someone not far removed from the eyewitnesses that went unchallenged. The third criterion is the author used good judgment in his use of those sources, and I contended that Matthew and Luke stick closely to Mark, more closely than virtually all other biographers of that period stick with their sources. That went unchallenged. The fourth criterion is that the authors and their sources were capable of reporting accurate history. And here I contended that the miraculous nature of Jesus' deeds and both the repetition and rhetoric of his teachings made it quite easy to recall them accurately decades later. Now, Bart did respond here. He brought up the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' speech, uh, high priestly prayer and speech in the Gospel of John. And he said, well, think about Barack Obama's presidential address. Do you remember that? Well, no. I only heard it once, and it was years ago. But again, that's different than Jesus' disciples who would have heard Jesus teach the same things over and over and over, and then they taught it over and over and over, and then Jesus went, and you know how it all goes. Well, Bart says, where does it say that Jesus said this over and over and over? Well, I agree, the Gospels don't say that, but I do think it's a fair inference. The, that would be the standard practice back then of what a teacher did with his disciples. Moreover, the, the, how often do the disciples or the Gospels mention Jesus eating? I think we can assume that he ate a whole lot more frequently than the Gospels mention. So the standard practice would have been for him to teach these same things over and over rather than come up with a new sermon for every village, town, and city. And I think because that would have been the standard practice, the burden of proof rests on Bart if he wants to argue otherwise. Now, in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, there's no question, Jesus, this is not a transcript of Jesus' uh, teachings uh, of what he said on that particular occasion. Um, I don't know of any New Testament scholars, even evangelical New Testament scholars, who would say that um, Matthew is a transcript of everything Jesus said on that occasion. But they would agree, I think, to the last one of them, that what Matthew has done is he has taken a core, t a core of some teachings that Jesus gave on that occasion, probably some of what we see in the Gospel of Luke, and then he has called a bunch of teachings that Jesus made over his ministry, and he's artistically combined them together in the Sermon on the Mount that we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Same thing would happen with the Gospel of John, that a lot of Jesus' teachings would have been put in that, and that wouldn't have been necessarily everything that he would have said on that occasion. This would have been standard practice for writing ancient biography and history because there's, they didn't have camcorders, they didn't have audio recorders. Uh, shorthand was in its infancy stages of development. This is the kind of way that history was reported. It is not to say that Matthew and John were inventing these teachings of Jesus, by no means. These would have been things that Jesus would have taught, but not necessarily all of them on that particular occasion. Number five, we can verify numerous uh, elements reported by the ancient author. Here I contended that many items in the Gospels can be verified, such as names, places, people, and many of Jesus' teachings and deeds, and this went uncontested. Finally, number six, no more than a very small percentage of items reported by the ancient author are false or known to be false. Here I listed more than a dozen items that are reasonably good candidates for being errors, yet I said that all of them are in minor details and don't undermine the overall reliability of the accounts. And I don't think that what Bart said challenged that. All he did was add some more to the list or even just expounded on some of the ones that I gave. For example, the infancy narratives. He says that the sensitive is not mentioned anywhere else. Well, guess what? Claudius' expulsion of the Jews from Rome, which is mentioned in the book of Acts. The only other place it's mentioned is in Suetonius' life of uh, Claudius Caesar in, in uh, chapter 26. If it had not been for two sentences in Suetonius, that would have been the Luke would have been the only person mentioning it. Um, and, and so just because it's singly attested doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Um, in terms of Quirinius, yeah, this, I admit, this is problematic. Um, it is one of those uh, uh, items in the Gospels that are potential errors. However, numerous uh, alternatives to error have been proposed, and the, and the matter is far from settled. 
Bart mentioned the death of Jesus, that John changes the day. I agree with him on this. I think John does change the day and the time of Jesus' crucifixion. He places it the day um, of the Passover meal, whereas the synoptics have it the day after the Passover meal. And John does this for theological reasons to highlight that Jesus is the Lamb of God, something which Paul had already mentioned in his uh, letters decades earlier. So it's not like he's inventing the theology. Nobody, not even Bart, is going to dispute that Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate and died as a result. It's just a matter of how John has done these things. And guess what? It's no different than what other of the most well-respected Roman historians did. For example, Tacitus moves the suicide of Piso months back in order to add to the drama of it. And Tacitus is considered to be the most accurate and greatest of the Roman historians. Sallust, another one of the most respected historians, talks about he takes the speech of Catiline and moves it back months in one case and moves it forward in another, a different one forward in another case in order to highlight the intensity and the nature of what was going on. But the speech actually happened. He just puts it at a different time. This is something, again, that would have been allowable in ancient history and biography. Bart mentions the saints raised at Jesus' death. I agree with him here. I think if we had a video camera and we're back there, I don't think we would have witnessed it. But as I've written and have in print elsewhere, I think that based on the Jewish literature and the Greco-Roman literature in the period, that Matthew is doing no differently than the Jewish and Greco-Roman authors here. And he's just basically using special effects, a literary device to highlight the importance of the death that had taken place. Jesus, the Son of God, had died. Now, to say that Matthew is just, this is a false story in there, I think is a miscategorization. It'd be like 200 years from now if a historian says, hey, I read that about 9-11, and some of the eyewitness said 9-11 was an earth-shaking event. Well, I looked through all the seismographs, and I didn't notice any kind of uh, earthquakes happening that day, so it must be historically unreliable. We'd say, no, you're missing the whole point. It's a linguistic idiom that was part of that culture. I think that's exactly what Matthew is doing here. All right, so i got to wrap up. Um, more on contradictions. Look, I've written a book on it. It was published last year by Oxford University Press. I spent eight years looking at ancient literature, compositional devices. I wrote a book uh, trying to answer the question, why are there differences in the Gospels? The title of the book is, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? <laughs> One final thing is, if Bart thinks that something is historically unreliable because it contradicts itself, um, I'd say he needs to look out because he contradicts himself. In a debate, our, one of our debates, when I cited a number of scholars, he replied and he said, Don't, you can't just cite scholars because scholars aren't evidence, they're just opinions. And then he goes on and on another occasion, he cites scholars uh, in support of his view to say that I'm wrong on some things. So, which one is it? Well, it depends which part you're listening to. So. If you're going to contradict yourself, I guess at that point, then you just discredited yourself. So Bart's challenges, I think, to the reliability of the Gospels fail, and we've already seen that there are good reasons to believe the Gospels are historically reliable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's a little bit unusual for me to be debating somebody who's agreeing with me. Uh, and I don't know if you all were picking up on this, but uh, Mike is agreeing that the Gospels are not accurate by modern standards. He's agreeing that, uh, that there are contradictions in the Bible, in the Gospels. He's agreeing that there are errors in the Gospels. Uh, he, he concedes the point. Uh, now, he thinks that they're generally reliable and that the gist is reliable. We can debate about that, but I want you to understand what he's arguing. He agrees that there are mistakes in the Gospels. He thinks that they're minor ones. He picks 12 of them. And maybe 12 is a small number. My question at the end of this is going to be, if we know that the Gospels are wrong in some small things, how do we know that they're not wrong in big things? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, 
It's, it's true. These were people who were writing following ancient standards of historiography. They were following ancient standards. What else could they do? They were ancients. But most of us, when we want to know are the Gospels reliable, we're not asking the question that, that academic pinheads like Mike and I are interested in. We academic pinheads are interested in things like, how does Luke stack up against Plutarch? You know, I mean, how many of you have stayed up at night wondering how Plutarch stacks up against Luke? I mean, it's not something we worry about. If you want to know if the Gospels are reliable, look, you read the Bible, you want to know, did it happen this way? Did Jesus say this? Did he do this? Or not? I mean, for me, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, my, it's what I do for a living to figure out how close it is to Plutarch. But it's not really the question we're debating here. We want to know whether the Gospels record what Jesus said and did accurately. Suppose you find an ancient map and you want to know, is this map accurate? Well, you wouldn't ask, well, you know, did it follow ancient methods of following maps so that uh, its mistakes can be explained? And so, well, by ancient standards, it's not bad. If you ask, is this map accurate? You're asking, if I want to go from point A to point B, will this map tell me how to do it or not? You want to know if it is accurate. Not whether the person was limited in his abilities to write a map, but whether it's accurate or not. We're asking, are the Gospels accurate or not? I continue to be a little bit surprised that Mike doesn't look at the actual evidence of the Gospels. He, he, he said that, you know, well, I didn't refute his six, six points. I mean, one reason I didn't refute his six points is because I didn't know what his six points were going to be, <laughs> and I, I, uh, I was giving my own speech. The reason I didn't actually refute his points is because they strike me as being kind of general statements that don't have any, he, he didn't cite any evidence for them. Uh, did the Gospels intend to write accurately or not? Did they use good sources? Did they use good judgment? Uh, well, he says yes. Okay, but I mean, what am I going to argue? I mean, there, what I want to talk about is, is the evidence. And I would like you to consider actually looking at the evidence yourself to decide where does the evidence take you. Let me point out some more evidence. Here's an interesting exercise for you to do sometime. There are two genealogies of Jesus in the New Testament. Genealogies that trace his bloodline. They're both interesting. One's in Matthew, and one's in Luke. Matthew's is in chapter one, Luke's is in chapter three. They've got some major differences between them. Matthew's genealogy traces his line back to Abraham, the father of the Jews. Luke's genealogy traces him back to Adam. That's a genealogy. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an aunt who's a genealogist who traced my family line back to the Mayflower. The Mayflower, phew, Adam and Eve, that's a genealogy. <laughs> you get these two genealogies. Look at them yourself and ask, who is Joseph's father? Who's Joseph's grandfather? Who's his great-grandfather? Who's his great-great-grandfather? They are different genealogies, and they are both explicitly genealogies of Joseph. Now, it might seem a little bit weird that they're giving genealogies of Joseph in the first place, because Jesus is not related to Joseph. But they give the genealogies of Joseph, and they're different genealogies. How could that be? Well, because I mean, they both can't be right. Or take another thing, at the end of Jesus' life, Peter's denials of Jesus. Peter denies Jesus three times. Does he deny him three times before the cock crows at all or before the cock crows twice? And if you look at the denials, he denies him to different people in different gospels. The, the, the way some fundamentalists reconcile this is by saying that, Je that Peter denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed and three times before it crowed twice, so that P Peter denied Jesus six times. Well, that's clever, and it's precisely what none of the Gospels say. Now, I'm not, Mike, doesn't, Mike doesn't do that. I mean, he agrees. This is a contradiction. But here we go, another contradiction. We could go all night talking about the contradictions, and Mike's going to agree with most of the things I say, and then he's going to come out and say, and the Gospels are historically reliable. And I don't quite understand that. If there are mistakes, there are mistakes. If there are stories of zombies that didn't happen, then it didn't happen. 
How is it accurate if it didn't happen? Uh, right, my point four. Mike had one very interesting point that I wanted to talk about for a second, because it, it was the, the, the first time that he actually got to evidence from the Gospels in his point five. Uh, I don't know if you're all taking notes. It doesn't look like you are. But his point five was that you can verify, uh, verify names in the Gospels and places in the Gospels. The Gospels mention places that actually exist. Therefore, they're reliable. They name people. They give names, like the name James and the name John. And, you know, the, these are names that, that, like, occur at the time. So they're accurate. And, you know, I, I, I just don't see how that makes the Gospels accurate. Uh, so I teach in Chapel Hill. Suppose in uh, 2,000 years, uh, there's a story floating around that on uh, February uh, 21st in 2018, Professor Ehrman was going from his office in Carolina Hall to his classroom in Murphy Hall where he was teaching a class on the historical Jesus. And before he got to that building, it was blown up by a bomb placed by, uh, by, by some uh, student who didn't want to take his midterm or something like that. So, so uh, all right. So in 2,000 years, an archaeologist comes around. And he digs up. There is a place like Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, it's a place. And uh, they find the records. And there is a Professor Ehrman who was teaching there. It's accurate. And he, he was in Carolina Hall. That's where he taught. And they find the records. And yes, he taught a class in Murphy Hall that day. That story is historically accurate because the names and the places fit. No, it's not accurate. There was no bomb that went off this morning to blow up the building because of a disgruntled student. The story isn't accurate. And so what good does it do to tell you that, yes, there really was a place named Nazareth? You know, there really was a place named Bethlehem. Yes, Joseph is a common name. Mary is a common name. Well, that's nice, but it doesn't tell you if the stories are accurate. To know if the stories are accurate, you have to look at them. You have to engage in a study of them to see whether they're accurate. If you have two stories that tell the same story and they're at odds with each other, they both obviously can't be right. Mike mentioned the book that he wrote, and I read it this weekend. I, uh, yeah, so congratulations. I mean, Oxford University Press. It's a, it's a significant study of Plutarch and the Gospels. Plutarch was one of the most highly educated men of his era. He was one of the very upper crust literary elite. The Gospel writers, frankly, were not. They were not on his level. But they did write biographies, and he wrote biographies. And Mike tells us, that in Plutarch's biographies, this is the best biographer of his day, as he just told us, there are, fa I'm quoting him, Mike, there are factual errors. He has a faulty memory. He bends the facts. He has no commitment to present the facts with legal precision. He takes liberty with his, liberties with his sources. He mixes history and conjecture. He sacrifices historical truth. That's the best biographer. And the Gospels are not on his level. How can we possibly say that they're historically accurate? Here's the big deal. It is really... If, if you just look at the Gospels carefully, if you just read them carefully by reading the story in one Gospel with the story of another Gospel and comparing them, you can see that there are these differences. They can't all be accurate, especially in those small things. But what about the big things? Here's a big thing. In the Gospel of John, Jesus makes claims for himself as a divine being. Jesus goes around in Galilee and in Jerusalem claiming to be divine. He claims that he is equal with God. I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name that God gave himself when talking to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Jesus says before Abraham, what? Abraham lived 1,800 years earlier. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. The Jewish opponents know exactly what he's saying. They pick up stones to stone him to death. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Whoa. 
That's in the Gospel of John. Jesus repeatedly makes divine claims for himself. And here's a striking factoid. He never does so in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. How can that be? As Mike pointed out, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are based on earlier sources. We know some of these sources. Mark, Q, M, L. In none of these sources does Jesus make these claims for himself. Only in the last gospel, written 65 years after Jesus' death, does anybody have Jesus declare himself as God. How could Jesus himself have actually called himself God, gone around in his ministry calling himself God in Galilee and in Jerusalem, spent his ministry talking about himself as a divine being? How could that have happened? And our earliest sources don't talk about it. This wasn't important enough even to mention? It would be the most important thing you could possibly say about Jesus. He called himself God. But he does it only in our last gospel. You see why it's important whether these gospels are accurate. Did Jesus call himself God or not? Thank you very much. Well, thanks again, Bart. Just to remind what we're, I'm contending this evening, I'm contending that we must assess historical literature in view of the literary conventions in play at the time of writing. And in relation to ancient historical literature, I defined historically reliable as preserving an accurate gist or an essentially faithful representation of what occurred. I then offered six criteria by which we may assess ancient historical literature and contended that the Gospels meet all six Therefore, they are historically reliable. So let's uh, go back and review those again in view of what Bart just said. The first criterion is the author intended to write an accurate account. And I said the Gospels were written close to the events. Large-scale conjecturing was not necessary. And that they chose not to omit embarrassing details, which suggests that they were attempting to report accurate history. Bart says, well, again, we're not looking by ancient standards. We're looking by modern standards. That's what we want to ask tonight. Well, I'm defining it by ancient standards. But I have contended that um, even by modern standards, we take these kinds of liberties. For example, Nabil's book, remember the kind of things that he said he did. That's the same kind of stuff that they did in antiquity. And this, Nabil was not unique in doing that. Lots of biographers and historians do it. Um, Remember, I said 200 years from now, they're going to be doing things differently and, and make the way we do history now look poor. But we would, wouldn't want them to say, well, these guys were just bozos back then. They weren't reporting things that were reliable. And we should extend the same kind of charity to those in antiquity. Um, now, Bart says uh, that Plutarch was the best biographer. He was highly educated. He was the best biographer. And he would bend truth. Yes, he would, in order to make points. Now, he had a lot more factual errors in those older biographies, like of Romulus and Thesis, because these guys li lived 800 to 1,000 years before his own time. And like he said, he, had no good, he didn't have good sources on which to go. He said, poets and fabulists. So basically, he said, I had to form these things and craft them in a way that sounded like history, but don't be under the illusion that they are good history here. But when you get to the ones more close to Plutarch's own time, like within 150 years, he's got good sources. And then he is quite accurate. And as Christopher Pelling at Oxford retired about two years ago, um, and he's the leading Plutarch scholar in the world, he says, Plutarch is true enough. So by comparing Matthew and Luke with Mark, I think what's good, you compare Matthew and Luke with, with how they use Mark, and we see that they stick closer to their sources than Plutarch does to his. Now actually, by good literary standards in that day, Plutarch was a better writer than the Gospel authors. It's precisely because they didn't take the kind of liberties that Plutarch took, that Tacitus took, that Sallust took, that Suetonius took at times, that they are reporting more accurately as the way we would want it today, especially Mark and Luke. Matthew is kind of, Mar Mark and Luke are like our literal translations. Matthew is our NIV, and John is a really good paraphrase.
Okay, so then we go on to the fourth one where I said the author and his sources were capable of reporting accurate history. And he says, well, what about the Sermon on the Mount? Um, did I already deal with that one, the Sermon on the Mount? Okay. Okay, number five, we can verify numerous elements reported by the ancient author. And I mentioned how many items in the gospel, such as names, places, people, and many of Jesus' teachings and deeds can be verified. He says, well, this doesn't mean it's accurate overall. Well, I agree with that. But remember, I said the names, places, Jesus' deeds, and his teachings. You put all that together. Look, we just don't have anachronisms. There's, it's not like they're talking about Mary and Joseph and Thomas and Fred. All right, these are all names that would have been common to Jews in that region, in that period. You go outside of Palestine, you got different Jewish names. So it shows that these authors were familiar with Palestine around the time of Jesus, and that points to reliability. It, it's not something that you would just look at in and of itself and say, that means it's reliable, but it sure points in that direction. It favors reliability. Number six, no more than a very small percentage of items reported by the ancient authors are known to be false. And here he persists in talking about contradictions. He said, did I say that there are mistakes? No, I didn't. What I did say, and because I've got it, I was quoting from my opening statement, so I know I didn't say it. What I said was that there are about a dozen or so, a little more than a dozen, that items that are reasonably good candidates for being errors. Now to be clear, are they errors? I don't know, maybe they are, maybe they're not. I don't know. But even if they are, what I said is, if they are errors, it doesn't really matter or, or look on the overall historical reliability of the text. You don't have to have 100% accuracy. My wife is excellent with her memory, excellent. Better memory than me. But there have been a few times in our marriage when I know she's gotten things wrong. That doesn't mean she's not reliable. I'd also say on Facebook, some of us, probably most of us are guilty at times of forwarding something that ended up being fake news. Now, if it's something that it's done on a regular basis, I'd say that person's unreliable. But once in a while you could do it, it doesn't mean a person is not reliable. He says, well, what about the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, well, that these are conflicting? Well, number one, the authors are selective. Even some of the top old evangelical Old Testament scholars out there will say that the genealogies um, are selective. They're only choosing certain generations that they want to put down. Um, moreover, Matthew is incorporating a rhetorical device called gematria, in which you assign numerical uh, value to certain letters, like A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, etc. And when you look at the word David, Dawid, it has the numerical value of 14. Well, what does Matthew do in his genealogy? Very, very clear. He divides it into three sets of 14. And even in the third set, he even cheats by reusing the 14th one in the second set, Jeconiah, just so he can get his three sets of 14. So it's really clear that what he's doing here is an artistic device of gematria. He's basically saying Jesus is the son of David. He's the son of David. He's the son of David. He's the Messiah. He's painting a literary portrait of Jesus. It doesn't mean the genealogy is just completely invented. It means that he is crafting it in such a way that would artistically illustrate the point that he's trying to make. And I have no problem with that. Um, he said, well, Peter denies Jesus. Did the cock crow once or twice? And who questioned him? Hey, these are discrepancies in the Gospels. No question about it. Plausible alternatives have, have our solutions have been uh, looked at at this. Um, I think the toughest one had to, it was the second person who was interviewing Peter there um, and saying, hey, are you, you are or one of him. And Peter denies it. Well, in Mark, you've got, it's the same servant girl. In Matthew, it's a different one. In, in Luke, it's a male servant. So what's going on here? I don't know. I mean, I could present a couple of different things. Worst case scenario, there's a tradition that people know, because there was eyewitnesses, that Peter was questioned three times in the courtyard of the high priest. He denied it three times. And they're trying to fill in the blanks, as any good narrative biographer or historian would do. It doesn't mean that the account itself is unreliable. So I still stick to my contention. I think we have good reasons to believe that the Gospels are historically reliable, and I don't find Bart's uh, arguments to the contrary persuasive. Uh, okay, so... 
Uh, we seem to agree there are differences in the Gospels that are discrepancies. Uh, and uh, Mike doesn't want to go all the way and say that there are errors because he might have some explanations for them. Uh, in all those instances, he and I have looked at every existing explanation, and neither one of us is satisfied with those explanations. So maybe they're explanations. What I want to talk about is why there are differences in the Gospels. And here's a point in which we're going to disagree, uh, in case you were looking for a point. Here's a point at which we will disagree. Uh, Mike contends that the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony. I would like to know his evidence of it. They don't claim to be based on eyewitness testimonies. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, anyway, don't claim at all to be based on eyewitness testimonies. Jesus' native language is Aramaic. The disciples of Jesus were lower-class Aramaic day laborers who lived in a remote part of Galilee. They were not educated. At this time in ancient Palestine, the best study indicates that only 3% of the population could read and write. Catherine Hetzer, uh, literacy, uh, Jewish literacy in uh, Roman Palestine. Uh, you can look it up and see the evidence. For all of this, you ought to look at the evidence because it's the evidence that matters. Most people couldn't read and write. The disciples of Jesus couldn't read and write. They were Aramaic-speaking day laborers. They didn't have an education. They didn't write the Gospels. The Gospels don't claim to be written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are names given to the Gospels much later. The first time they're attested as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is at the end of the second century, 100 years later. Here's something worth thinking about. The Gospels are written in highly literate Greek. They're written in highly literate Greek by educated Greek-speaking Christians living 40, 50, or 60 years later. They weren't eyewitnesses. Where does, Matt, where does Mark claim to be based on Peter's testimony? He doesn't. Where does Matthew say that he's basing his Sermon on the Mount on an eyewitness? He doesn't. These are people who have heard stories about Jesus. They're living outside of Palestine. They don't speak Aramaic. They're Greek-speaking people living somewhere else. We don't even know where. Rome, Antioch, Antioch, Ephesus, we don't know. How do they get their stories? Well, how does anybody get the stories in Ephesus about things that happened in Palestine? They've heard stories that have been circulating around the Roman world until they come to them. They're writing stories that they heard in Greek, not in Aramaic. 40, 50, 60 years later, of course there are differences in the Gospels. Think about who wrote these things. Let me give you one example of the difference in the Gospel that actually matters. A difference again in the death of Jesus. The gospel writers want to emphasize different things. And the problem with thinking that they're all accurate is that it means that you read one of the gospels as if it's saying the same thing as another one of the gospels, when in fact they might be emphasizing different things based on the different stories that they've heard. Here's the example. It has to do with Jesus' demeanor going to his death. What was Jesus' demeanor going to his death? What, how was he approaching his own death? In Mark's Gospel, Jesus is, uh, is on trial before Pontius Pilate, and he's silent. Pilate can't understand why he's silent. Pilate asks him, are they king of the Jews? And Jesus says only two words, su leges, you say so. That's all he says. He's taken off to be crucified and doesn't say anything on the road to crucifixion. He's silent the entire way. He's nailed to the cross, and he's silent the entire time. Both of the people being crucified with him, both of the robbers being crucified with him, both of them mock him in Mark's gospel. And Jesus is silent, doesn't say anything. You wonder, what is going on here? Why is Jesus so silent? It's as, as if he's in shock. And at the end, in Mark's gospel, Jesus says the only time in the entire proceeding, at the end, he finally cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
and he dies. That's it. It is the most amazing account, gripping in its pathos, of a man who at the end feels forsaken by God himself and dies on the cross. As Mike has pointed out, Mark was one of the sources for Luke. Luke also tells an account of Jesus going to his death, basing his account on Mark, but changing it in places. And the changes he makes are significant. In Luke's account, while Jesus is going to be crucified on the road, he's not silent. He sees these women by the side of the road weeping. And he turns to them and he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. He's more concerned about these women than he is about himself. When he arrives and they nail him to the cross, he's not silent. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. While he's hanging on the cross, Jesus is not silent. He, has, he actually has an intelligent conversation with one of these robbers. One of the robbers mocks Jesus in Luke. The other one tells him to be quiet because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. And he turns his head to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus is not in shock in Luke's gospel. He's not wondering why this is happening to him. He's not wondering why God has, for, has forsaken him. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows why it's happening to him, and he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise with this man next to him. Most telling of all, at the end of Luke's account, instead of crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke because he doesn't feel forsaken in Luke. Instead in Luke, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he dies. This is a Jesus who is calm and in control of his situation. It's a very different Jesus from the one portrayed in Mark. What people do, though, is they take Mark's account and they take Luke's account and they lump them together into one account so that Jesus says and does everything in both accounts, thereby eliminating the emphasis of each one. And then they throw in Matthew and John for good measure, and you end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus. You can do that if you want with the Gospels. But if you combine them all together, ignoring the emphasis of each, you have written your own Gospel. You're free to do that, but it's not one of the Gospels of the New Testament. Each Gospel is different. And it's not just the fact they have contradictions or errors. It's that each one is trying to emphasize something distinct. And if you don't let them each emphasize what they emphasize, you're robbing the authors of their own, their own, their own emphasis and their own integrity as authors who are trying to commu communicate a story about Jesus. Thank you very much. If you thought that was fun so far, we now move on to our period that we call Crossfire, where I set these two guys against each other and I'm going to somehow sit in the middle of this and try to keep it under control. Uh, in order to keep this from turning into a, a free-for-all, I think it would be fair if in this next 10-minute portion, uh, Dr. Lacona, you pose questions to Dr. Ehrman and Dr. Ehrman, you answer. For five minutes, you pose questions and then we can switch over to Dr. Ehrman, does this seem fair? Sure. Okay. Dr. Lacona, please pose your questions. Okay. All right, Bart. Um, you said there in your second rebuttal that the disciples could not have been the gospel authors because they weren't educated. Um, the gospels are written in Greek, but the disciples would have been spoken in Aramaic. So I think of Cicero, one of the highly, most highly educated people in the late Roman Republic. And even though he's so educated, we've got lots of letters that he's written and essays that have survived, yet there's one occasion when he's writing to Tiro, his, his amanuensis, his secretary, his scribe, 
And he says, Anthony was over for dinner and he asked me to read something. And I said, no, nah, I, I can't because Tiro isn't here and he makes me sound so much better. And we know that Paul used uh, scribes as well on several occasions. In fact, in Romans uh, 16, 22, he says, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, send you my greetings. So we know that since that's the crown jewel of Paul's letters, that these secretaries of Cicero and Paul probably did a whole lot more than just taking dictation. They did some major editing as well, and then Cicero and Paul would have signed off on it. So if that was good enough for people like Cicero and Paul, why is there such a problem thinking that the gospel authors uh, were the same thing to some of the disciples? Why is it a, a problem that, let's say, John, if, if he's illiterate, that he just had an amanuensis, a scribe, write this stuff down and kind of do the editing. Or, you know, if it wasn't John, number one of Jesus' disciples, the same kind of stuff with Matthew and, and this. And maybe Luke was someone who collected the, these testimonies. And if he didn't write it himself, then maybe he had a scribe or something. And same thing with Mark. I, I don't see what the problem is there. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to address that. Uh, about five years ago, I got really interested in the phenomenon of secretaries in the ancient world. And I looked up every reference that exists in Greek and Latin sources that I could find. There is no evidence of anyone at any time, to my knowledge, dictating a, uh, uh, an account in one language to be translated into another by a secretary. I don't know of a single instance. Uh, and the idea that secretaries are uh, seriously rewriting what is dictated to them appears to be without foundation. Uh, as you know, Randy Richards wrote a book on secretaries, and he couldn't find any evidence of that. Well, couldn't find any evidence of what? Of, of secretaries. There's only two examples in all of antiquity of a secretary who actually composed something for someone else. Well, we're not saying they composed, like, the gospel for someone else. They... It's like they did it. I'm not saying a pseudonymity here. I'm, I'm talking about that someone like, well, I would think Romans probably happened that way with Paul. Paul dictated Romans. Dictated, and all, that's all Tertius did. Yes, that's what secretaries did. They wrote down dictation. Oh, come on. Well, you got Cicero here that says, no, that's not the case, that he no. relied on Tiro to make his I, stuff I better. Give a, I give a, a detailed analysis of all of that. I know you did. I read your stuff. Counter forgery. So it's, it, it didn't happen. So. But, but just take John, for example. So if somebody wants to say that, um, that John, the son of Zebedee, uh, like told somebody what happened and then somebody wrote it down. So once again, as with everything, I want to know what would make you think so. In other words, what about the Gospel of John makes somebody think that that's what happened? The Gospel of John, um, first of all, never mentions the name John. True, John but none of Plutarch's lives mention the name Plutarch. None of uh, Plato no, 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 or no, no, Porphyry no. or but Galen Plut mentions Plutarch his name. Plutarch doesn't write a life of himself. The Gospel of John is about Jesus in relationship to his disciples. John is in, I mean, if John was a disciple for the Gospel of John, he'd be in the story, but his name never appears. So what does one make of that? I mean, in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm not concluding anything. I'm just saying that if John is such an important figure who wrote the Gospel of John, what, I mean, you'd have to say, well, he's like, he's so humble, he doesn't mention himself. Or Do you something. believe that John was one of the disciples? Yes. Well, then how the name John doesn't appear in the Gospel of John it's probably the beloved disciple. Oh, well, as you know. I, I, happen, they're, to be, they're, I happen to be with some, the minority of scholars that think John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the Gospel of John. Yes, that is a minority. Uh, yeah. Uh, John, the son of Zebedee, was a fisherman in rural Galilee. Yeah. He would not have had an education. Well, no, no I think he would have had an amanuensis, a, a scribe, and that wouldn't have been a problem at all. Well, but I mean... How, what is somebody, how is somebody supposed to think you're just not making that up? I mean, what, what's well, the Well, what's implausible here? about it? What's implausible? Because we have no evidence of anybody in the ancient world dictating an account in one language to be translated into another. Okay, so if, I, if you see me right now, and then tomorrow I come in, my hair's a whole lot shorter. You didn't see me get a haircut, but you can infer it. We've got stuff from the early church fathers, multiple accounts that talk about the authorship of, of these Gospels. And whether you like my evidence, at least I've got some evidence here that what, I'm presenting the, of who's... Okay, give me some evidence from John itself that is composed by, the, by John the son of Zebedee. 
I can't from John itself, but I do from the early church fathers who say it. Okay, who's the first church father? All right, wait a minute. I, you could say the same the thing first, about Plutarch and say, first, give me some church, evidence that Plutarch wrote any church? of those biographies that's oh, no, evident no, in the course, biographies. Of course. That but is a question. That's, that a question for all, that's a question for every author from antiquity. Did this person write it or not? But, but Plutarch doesn't claim to write them in any of the 50 surviving biographies, but nobody questions it. We still have good external Classicists evidence. Classicists question would... every author from every book from antiquity. They question Plato, they question everybody all the way up. It's a question for every author. But Did nobody seriously questions whether Plutarch wrote those 50 okay. biographies. Okay, so let me ask what the evidence is that John wrote it. My, again, you say that there's no evidence from the gospel itself. You say, well, there's evidence from the church fathers, okay? Who's the first church father to say that John wrote it? Well, that would probably be Irenaeus. Okay, when was Irenaeus living? Probably 170, 180. Okay, it's usually dated to 185. When do you date the Gospel of John? Probably 90 to 95. Okay, so 90 years later, you have one person who says it was John. Yeah. And okay. that'd be the same as, what, 1950? Uh, yeah, with having no record of it until now. What do you mean, until then? Well, there are other church fathers who know about the Gospel of John. Sure. They don't say anything about John writing it. Well, that's an argument from silence. Uh, I'm asking for what the evidence is. Well, I gave you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not are you using the evidence. I'm not saying the silence is evidence that you didn't write it. I'm asking you what the evidence is. And if, if the, your evidence is Irenaeus, uh, we could have a long talk about Irenaeus. But... Uh, but at least I'm given evidence. It's not That's as though not... nobody knew who wrote it. And he's the latest one. He's, okay. Matthew and Mark have better attestations. If we could, that. if we could. I, I would say, though, there's, there's clear evidence. You think John is the beloved disciple, right? I do. Okay. There is clear evidence that the beloved disciple did not write the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John indicates that the, that the beloved disciple did not write the Gospel I, of John. I know what you're going to quote, and I think he's speaking in the third person, which would have not been unusual for that day. Jesus speaks in the third person In other words, often. the author does not claim to be the beloved disciple and claims he got his information from the beloved disciple. I think he's speaking in third person. He is speaking in the third person because he's talking about a third person. Just like on the... It, it, <laughs> It's like on the Seinfeld episode, Jimmy did this, Jimmy did this. And Jesus did it. He said, the Son of Man's going to do this. The Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head, and he's referring wow. to himself. We only had 10 minutes for this, and I haven't asked a question yet. I oh, know. Please, <laughs> go ahead. We can go on. Uh, okay, so Mike, you, uh, okay. You, you do agree that there are things in the Gospels that are not accurate as related. You don't think the zombies it, thing happened. It, yeah, I mean, if we're going to say that every single word happened precisely no, I'm not as asking in that. a legal transcript, no, I'm no, not asking it, that. It didn't. I'm just asking, do you think there are things in the Gospels that are not accurate? I, I don't know. There's, I gave you some candidates that I think they okay. may be incorrect, but I would you, say the same of Plutarch. Do you think... Yes. Do you think that the zombies happened? I, I don't think if we had been there, we would have seen the zombies. Okay. I think that that is a rhetorical literary okay. device going on. Do you on. think there are other things we wouldn't have seen? So uh, give me an example. I'm asking you for examples. Um, is that the only thing in the Gospels that you think is not accurate? Well, I didn't say it's not accurate. You're putting words in my mouth. Wait. If I said 9-11 was an earth-shaking event, you could say, well, that's not accurate, Mike. And I'm saying, you're missing the whole point. Right. Uh, so I'm trying to get my mind around this. So when Matthew says that the dead came out of the tomb and walked around, you're saying, yep. no, that didn't really happen, but you're saying it's not inaccurate. I, I'm saying it's the same kind of genre there as Peter at Pentecost when he's referring to Joel chapter 2 with young men having visions, old men having dreams, and Joel chapter 2 talks about the sun going dark and the moon turning into blood. No, I don't think that they thought the sun went dark, the moon turned into blood that day. I think they're using this as, um, as poetic, apocalyptic kind of Im okay. imagery. I'm just getting a little frustrated because I'm not getting a direct answer. Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you, I think you're mixing genres here and it's not fair. What's the genre of the, jo of the zombies? I think that this is apocalyptic kind of apocalyptic kind of uh, 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 symbolism that's put in there, just like when they talk about uh, eclipses of the sun and comets in the sky. In many of these occasions, 
um, that we can show that these eclipses of the sun didn't happen, but the comet was actually there. They would mix these portents in order to highlight the intensity and the meaning behind the event. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, right. Uh, well, keep reading my book. No, I... I, I, I... <laughs> okay. I, I'm just sorry, Mike, because you, you don't think that the zombies came out of the tomb, but you want to That's say correct. it's still accurate. Okay. Uh, uh, all right. So, uh, uh, do, do, you, do you, you do agree that there appear to be contradictions in the New Testament, in the Gospels? I, I think that there are some that I cannot reconcile by compositional devices. And there what, are what a handful. stops you from saying there are mistakes? Well, there are some of them, like, uh, let's just say, uh, maybe the Quirinius one. That looks to me like that could very well be an error. Okay. But the one that you cited, like, did, did they, Jesus first appear to them in Galilee or Jerusalem? I, I think that that has a, a reasonable explanation for it, and some of these things okay, have so really just, good explanations. Let me just review. In Luke, he says, don't leave Jerusalem, right. and they don't. Yep. In Matthew, they're told to go to Galilee, yep. and they do. Yes. Okay, so what's the reasonable explanation for that? I would think that uh, Luke is certainly compressing the account and setting everything in Jerusalem. It doesn't mean they didn't go to Galilee. Luke definitely knows that, I mean, as you said in your opening statement, you've got Luke having the resurrection, all of the appearances and the ascension happening on Easter. But Luke obviously knows it happened over a longer period of time because in his sequel, the book of Acts chapter 1, he says that he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Wait, Mike, I'm just confused here. Luke says, don't leave Jerusalem. They don't leave Jerusalem. They're no. there until the day of Pentecost. But you're saying that he, that he thinks they did go to, to Galilee? No. Why couldn't it be that he is compressing the account? Like, for example, I think that first appearance probably happened in Galilee, but Luke situates it in Jerusalem there when you compare the two okay. accounts. All he's right. talking about okay. the same one. And he's enough. putting okay. everything. You can, can just stop right there. So the appearance was in Galilee, but Luke says it was in Jerusalem. Because and you think that that's accurate? Yeah, he's compressing the account. I see what he's doing. There's no problem there. He's compressing the account for uh, economy of, of time or space, and then he's wanting to emphasize Jerusalem as probably the headquarters what would of the make church. It, what would make it inaccurate? Um, he appeared to them in Africa. <laughs> but why couldn't you say he appeared to them in Africa? Well, if he did, that'd be fine. But if exactly. he's... But he's doing a compression here, time compression. He's not it's compressing some... time, he's compressing places. Yeah, both. One says he did not appear to them in Galilee, and the other says that, uh, that one says that he did not appear in Galilee, the other says he did no, appear in Galilee. No, one says he appeared in Galilee, one says he appeared in Jerusalem. They don't leave Jerusalem. Because so how could they Luke, see him in Galilee? Because Luke is compressing the account, and he situates everything in Jerusalem. Yes, he does. He obviously and knows not accurate. that, but he has it all on Easter, where it's, again, okay. Acts chapter 1, he's, he's obviously knows that he was there for a longer period of time. Yeah, in Acts 1, he's there for 40 days with them, and where is he? He's in Jerusalem. Yes. Well, no, it doesn't say. <laughs> yes, it, it does. It doesn't say that he was in Jerusalem the whole time he ascended from the Jerusalem area on the Mount of Olives, but it doesn't say he was there the whole time. Okay. I see no reason why he couldn't have gone to, to Galilee except, in the meantime. Except he says, stay in, stay in Jerusalem. Yep, and, and he could have said that they're, they're after they the returned from Galilee. All right, like we're just arguing about these nitty things. Look, I mean, I, no, I, I'm willing to admit that there are some potential errors in the New Testament. I just don't think that's one of them that's easily accounted for by compositional okay. devices. So my, my final question, this will be quick. How many errors would it take before you would agree that they're inaccurate? I don't know a number, um, but as I said, I, you know, if someone on Facebook uh, or let's say your wife, that she has said some false things over time, but she is by and large very reliable. I'd say she's a reliable source, even though she gets things wrong once in a while. What's the number of things? What's the percentage? I don't know. But if it's small, I, th I have no problem saying it's reliable. We're not asking if it's inerrant. We're asking, is it historically reliable? Yeah, well, okay. So if I, if I go to MapQuest tonight to try and get someplace, and I know the MapQuest is, is wrong, I'll, 10 times, 20 times out of the last 100 that I've asked, I'm not sure I'm going to trust it. That, that's a good point, but that's the, the degree of precision that we expect out of something like a map. The debate is, are the Gospels reliable? But they're not maps. They're biographies. They're not, and, the, and, and biographies change the facts in order to make their emphases. And that's why this is my favorite part of the debate. Good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you.
So now we move on to our closing statements. Each speaker has five minutes apiece. Dr. Lacona, your closing statement. Well, I want to thank Bart for an enjoyable exchange this evening. I always feel challenged by him in a healthy way, and for that I'm grateful. This evening I've contended that we must assess historical literature in view of the literary conventions in play at the time of writing. In relation to ancient texts, I defined historical reliability as preserving an accurate gist or an essentially faithful re representation of what occurred. I then offered six criteria and contended that the Gospels meet all six, therefore the Gospels are historically reliable. Bart appealed to differences, uh, the contradictions. Now, I understand the differences as resulting from compositional devices, by and large, that were common to the literary conventions of writing in that era. And um, I also pointed out that Bart has himself contradicted himself pertaining to the value of scholarly opinion. I could have named a couple other things. So by his own standards, he's disqualified himself as a reliable witness if we use those standards. Bart also said that we have no idea who wrote the Gospels and that they were far removed from the eyewitnesses. Well, that's false. The majority of scholars today, critical scholars, um, have ideas of who wrote them. And we saw that their authors were not at all far removed from the eyewitnesses, and some may even have been eyewitnesses. Bart's view is a position that is held by a minority of scholars. If he says we have no idea who knew them, who wrote them, and that they bear no uh, trace of eyewitnesses. Bart also says that a story is not historically reliable if it only preserves the gist, if the order differs, or if an author alters the detail to make a point that's true, then the story is not historically reliable. But to me, that seems a bit wooden, uh, a wooden literalist way to assess a story, and is not at all how historians, at least, would look at reliability. Now, this watch I'm wearing right now was given to me as a Christmas present by my parents around 1979. Um, it's not a quartz watch, it's a Seiko automatic. Is it reliable? Well, that depends on the extent of precision required. If I worked for NASA or SpaceX and was in charge of coordinating things in order to launch rockets, well, then it would be no, by no means be reliable. But for the events in my life, such as meeting someone for lunch, or um, catching a flight tomorrow morning, this watch is plenty reliable. In fact, for what I need it, it doesn't even need a second hand. The Gospel authors were writing according to the literary conventions of their day. Those conventions gave them a license to paraphrase, uh, to adapt Jesus' teachings slightly, and to arrange material as they saw fit. And they did. But they took far fewer liberties than virtually any other ancient biographer took. And in the opinion of many critical scholars, the Gospels are rooted and filled with eyewitness testimony. Moreover, if we follow Bart's concept of historical reliability, we'd not only have to reject the Gospels as being historically reliable, but also virtually other all ancient historical literature. Now, not everyone is as interested in these matters as Bart and I are. And of course, that's fine. A far more important matter is whether Jesus rose from the dead. After years of focused investigation of the historical data, I'm quite confident Jesus' resurrection is an event that occurred in history. And if it did, God's message of, uh, or Jesus' message of God's love for us is something we can hold with confidence. I'm sure Bart will agree with me that Dale Allison is one of the very finest New Testament scholars in the world today. After wrestling with numerous matters related to the historical Jesus, Allison writes, while I am proudly a historian, I must confess that history is not what matters most. If my deathbed finds me alert and not overly racked with pain, I will then be preoccupied with how I have witnessed and embodied faith, hope, and charity. I will not be fretting over the historicity of this or that part of the Bible. Allison can have this attitude because he has also wrestled with the data and has also concluded that Jesus' resurrection was a historical event. And that's important because if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true, period. Even if Bart were correct about the Gospels, and he's not.
Well, yes, and I, uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and, uh, and Mike as well. I always enjoy these back and, back and forths, and they uh, tend to be, get rather lively on occasion. Uh, I'm going to do a couple things in my concluding uh, time, but before I get to that, I just want to, I want to say that, on, um, uh, that I, I really appreciate the organizers who have put this together, and, uh, and I appreciate all the effort uh, that went into it. I hope that you've, you, found it, uh, you found it useful. Um, on a couple points, Mike and I are simply going to disagree. We're gonna disagree on what is factual information. I think it is factually wrong to say that most New Testament scholars think that the uh, Gospels are written by people that we, that we know who wrote these Gospels. It's factually wrong. Uh, most New Testament scholars say we don't know that they, 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 in fact, are anonymous writers. They certainly were not the disciples of Jesus. That is, that is by far the widest opinion. Uh, moreover, the claim that I would have to reject all ancient history if I reject the Gospels is absolutely false. There are other historical writings from the ancient world that are far superior to the Gospels historically. They may not be as interesting to read, and they may not be as religiously important, but they are far more significant. But I'm not gonna spend the rest of my time talking about that. I wanna do two things. First, I wanna tell you about my blog. Uh, I have a blog. So uh, it's called the Bart Ehrman blog. You can look it up. Uh, I post five or six times a week, a thousand words a day, on everything related to early Christianity, the historical Jesus, the Gospels, the writings of Paul, the Apostolic Fathers, the books that didn't make it into the New Testament, how we got the New Testament, how, all the way up to the, emperor, the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, five or six times a week. And people make comments, I answer all the comments, I mean, like, this goes on, so every day, and you could belong to this blog. The only deal is, you have to pay. I charge $24.95, for a year's membership, but I don't keep a dime. Every penny goes to charity. Uh, I use this as a way of raising money for hunger, uh, for people, for, for hunger and homelessness charities. Uh, last year, the, the blog raised $134,000. So we're talking serious money. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's, it's fine. So, uh, it, it's a good cause. You get a lot. You get a lot for your money, and uh, and it helps everybody. So there are no losers. So uh, I, I hope you will uh, consider uh, looking up the Barterman blog. Let me conclude by saying that uh, unlike unlike Mike, uh, it really doesn't matter to me what you personally believe. Um, I mean, I'm sure if I knew you, I'd be interested in you. <laughs> uh, but I'm not really interested in changing your personal religious views or commitments. I'm certainly not interested in uh, having you, uh, if you're a Christian now, I'm not interested in deconverting you or, or changing your, making you become an agnostic or uh, turning you into some kind of crazy secular humanist. Uh, or if you're an atheist, I, I mean, I'm not, your personal reviews are your personal views. Uh, I am interested in urging you to think about what it is you believe and why you believe it. There's never been a more important time than now for people to be thinking about what they really think. People, people love to hear other people who agree with them, who reinforce what they already think. People tend not to like to hear people who challenge them to think for themselves. People like to hear a favorite preacher, a favorite politician, a favorite news channel. People often listen so that they can feel comfortable that they are already right. But maybe we shouldn't be so comfortable. If you don't think critically, you're simply a sheep following where it's led. That is an uninteresting life and in our times, that can be socially dangerous, leading to horrible results. It's important for all of us to think for ourselves, to question our assumptions, to challenge our views, to make sure that what we think is what we really think and not simply what we've been told. This is true of politics. 
It's true of our understandings of society, it's true of our personal ethics, and it's true of our religion. The opposite of knowledge is ignorance. It's far better to be a knowledgeable Christian, Jew, Muslim, agnostic, or atheist than an ignorant one. And I hope this debate has helped to that end. Thank you very much. We now move on to our final portion. It goes on after this. The question and answer portion, in which the audience members can line up on either side of the aisle here. Those of you who have questions for Dr. Ehrman, line up on this aisle. Those of you for questions, with questions for Dr. Lacona, line up over here. There are microphones in which you can pose your questions. We encourage you to ask questions. That is, we want you to have the courage to get up and ask your questions. But I would give you this piece of advice. You are asking questions and not delivering sermons. So perhaps brevity is in order. All right, uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Mic on. Okay, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my question is, is there historical evidence of scribal tampering which became canon? Describe the what that became? The tampering. Describe the tampering that became canon. Is there evidence of scribal tampering that became canon? Scribes changed the text and that became canon. Oh. Um, scribes that changed the text and became canon. I, I'm not clear on. No, he means like, did scribes add things to the text that became part of the canon? Oh, sure. Like. The ending of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Um, you know, uh, John, what is it, chapter 7, verses 53 through 8, 11. There are a few other places. And yeah, they got in, included in there, and they're in many Bibles today. But I think scholars are right to, to point out that these were not in the originals. And so therefore, our modern translations typically have brackets around them. And with a footnote at the bottom that says, these do not appear in the best manuscripts. And in fact, um, a lot of the Greek texts don't even include them. Yes, um, Dr. Roman, one of the questions people have about the Gospels is, of course, miracles. Now, in your book, Misquoting Jesus, you say, miracles by their very nature are always the least part of our explanation of what happened. Now I'm wondering, do you come to this conclusion in each case before looking at the evidence or after? Because if it's before, that can be understood, understandable. But if it's after, once you kind of saying that, first off, no amount of evidence could convince you a miracle had taken place. And second, if a miracle is what has taken place, don't you have a historical methodology that's already ruled it out beforehand then? Yeah, my, my view of miracles is that accepting miracles is a matter of faith not a matter of historical evidence. And that uh, people who are believers uh, have good grounds from their religion, from their faith, to think that miracles happened. Uh, but that um, obviously um, Christian scholars don't think that Muslim miracles probably happened, and uh, Jewish scholars probably think that Christian miracles probably didn't happen. And, the, the people who accept miracles are people who are within the faith communities, and that's because uh, this is a matter of, of faith. Uh, that's, that's why uh, you as a Christian, for example, would never convince uh, a non-Christian that Jesus really walked on the water and that you can prove it. It's, just, it's not gonna happen, so, uh, because they don't have the faith commitment you have. So I see it as a matter of, of faith, not a matter of historical demonstration. I guess in response, I would say that just uh, because a person has an inability to convince another person doesn't mean the evidence isn't good. And Bart knows this very well because he's been engaged in discussions with mythicists who deny Jesus existed. His inability to convince them that Jesus exists doesn't mean that the evidence for Jesus' existence is insufficient. When it comes to a miracle, I, I would say that if, if we have sufficient evidence that the event in question occurred, and if, um, there, if it's 
practically impossible for that event to have occurred by natural causes, well then we're safe to, in fact, we're reasonable to infer that it happened by a supernatural cause. Now, as a historian, I, I think we could show that Jesus rose from the dead, but I don't think that as a historian, I can show that it was God who raised him. Now, I do believe that it's a reasonable inference that God raised Jesus from the dead, but how could I show that, that it was God that raised him? But I do think we have sufficient evidence to show that he was raised. Could you just say what the alternative is to God raising him? Well, it could have been anything. It could have been aliens, an alien from a parallel universe doing a PhD experiment that had to uh, convince people that he was God in order to, uh, to get it. I mean... You know, and, I'm convinced. Yeah. <laughs> but, but see, the, the thing is, it, it's irrelevant. Uh, if there were no other explanations but God, well, that's all the more reason to believe God did it. But you don't deny the event itself because you can't prove the cause. There are many historical events for which we don't know the cause, but we don't deny the event itself. Yes. Um, Dr. Lacona, so earlier uh, Dr. Ehrman brought up uh, that Jesus claiming to be God is only found in John and is not found in any of the other Gospels. And I think we can all agree that is a pretty serious claim. So do you think you could offer any explanation on why it would only occur in John and maybe not the other ones? Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking that because I realized after I sat down I forgot to address that in, in my rebuttal. Um, I think that Jesus is clearly portrayed as God in the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest Gospel. And the reason I say this is when you read Plutarch's Life of Alexander the Great in the first chapter, he says, the purpose of biography is to give us a portrait of who this person is. They're not going to talk about all the events in the person's life. They'll even leave out, he'll even leave out events where uh, the person was responsible for slaying thousands. But he wants to capture those events that illustrate who this person is. So you think about the Gospel of Mark. It starts off, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths, as Isaiah the prophet said. It's not Jesus preparing the way for God. It's John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. Who does that say who Jesus is from the very beginning? Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals a paralytic and forgives him his sins, and the Jewish leaders present say, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Mm -hmm. Chapter 3, You've got uh, Jesus, I think it is, where he's uh, doing exorcisms and, and so forth, and they're saying, hey, uh, Satan casting out Satan, and he says, no, you got a strong man. If you want to, uh, to rob his house, you have to bind the strong man, and then you can uh, plunder his house. And basically, he's saying he has bound the strong man who is Satan. Well, what human can bind Satan? Then he walks on water, something that uh, Job chapter 9, verse 8 says only God does. He calms the storm, it says only God does. He does all these things all throughout Mark's gospel. Only God does these things. So what Mark does is he gives us a literary portrait of Jesus, of Jesus claiming to be God through his deeds. Whereas what I think in John's gospel, and virtually every single Johannine scholar will say, that John is giving us a paraphrase. He's taking Jesus' stuff and he's restating it in Johannine idiom. And many will say that John takes what Jesus would have said in, and done implicitly, and he restates it in an explicit, explicit manner. So did Jesus actually make some of these divine claims explicitly, word for word, like he does in John? Who knows? But whether he did or not is irrelevant. He still made claims through his actions and the things that he did that came to the same things, same conclusion. Yeah, I don't think it's irrelevant at all. I think that... Um, in John, when Jesus makes these explicit claims for himself, that he is the I am, that he is one with God, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If he actually made those claims, if the man himself made those claims, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke could not very well have overlooked that part. And so my question was, did Jesus talk about himself this way? And if so, how could all of these earlier sources just neglect to mention it? Uh, it doesn't seem plausible to me. Dr. Ehrman, what do New Testament historians do when they come across two historical criteria that conflict with each other? And the example that I'm thinking of is uh, Joseph Arimathea and his role in Jesus' burial. It meets the criteria of multi-attestation, but doesn't meet the criteria of historical plausibility since we know that Romans did not take people off the cross. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and you know, it goes to the very heart of what it means to be a historian, which is um, to establish what probably happened in the past. Um, doing history is not like doing science. Uh, where uh, if you're, if you're uh, doing an, an experimental science, you simply, you can, you can prove things by repeating the experiment time after time after time, and when you do that, then you establish a high level of probability that if you do the experiment again the same way, it's gonna come with the same result, and so you've proved what the result's gonna be. And with history, you can't do that because you can't repeat the experiment. And so you have other kinds of evidence that you use, other criteria, as you're saying, and often these criteria are in conflict with each other, which is why you have so many historians who disagree on so many fundamental things, because they're, they're weighing the evidence differently. And so that kind of gets to the heart of everything I've been trying to say, is I hope people, everybody weighs the evidence. Uh, and, and just kind of see, and you have to, so you have to balance it. And so, uh, so with Joseph of Arimathea, I mean, mo most scholars would say, well, the evidence is pretty good, and others would say, well, that's not so good, and so you have to, you have to make the decision then. The only thing I would add, I would challenge the thing that you said about the Romans leaving people on crosses. That was typical, that was the standard throughout the Roman Empire, but according to Josephus in Jewish War, Book 4, Section 317, he mentions that just a few years before the, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, so we're looking probably around the year 67 or 68, that it, he says that the Romans had hired some mercenaries to come in and they killed some Jews and they didn't allow for them to receive a proper burial. And the Jews in Jerusalem were really infuriated about this because it said it was their custom. The Romans allowed them to remove the crucified and the condemned and to bury them prior to sunset. That would have been in accordance with Jewish law and through the about 1,000 ossuaries that have been bone boxes discovered in Jerusalem that were dated from about 30 B.C. to 70 A.D., um, we see that this was a custom that the Romans whoa, allowed whoa, them to whoa, do. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. The ossuaries, what? No. <laughs> the ossuaries aren't evidence that they took the bodies off the cross. But they were evidence that they allowed people to receive proper burials. Not crucified people. Well, yeah, what about Yehohanan? discovered okay. in the late 1960s. Okay, we have one evidence of somebody who was crucified. Yep. Okay, how long was he left on the cross before they took his body off? Who knows, but it was... Exactly! Oh, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who knows? Um, the, but Josephus, what evidence is there? Josephus no, says no, no, that no, they no. were removed... No, 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 you said archaeological evidence. You said thousands of ossuaries, and I'm saying, what are these thousands of ossuaries you're talking about? It shows There's no that they gave them pro they allowed proper bear. Okay, what? I got you. How? All right, all right, you're right there. All right, okay. so we got one that allowed a proper burial for a crucified victim, of, of which I, I'm aware there, okay? But we don't what know I'm, how long it took for them to bury him. Josephus. No, hold on a second. You're talking about Yohanan. You're not talking about Josephus. All right, let me go back what to Josephus for a second. Is there that because that's where my point is to be made. And Josephus said that. Before, before these mercenaries, the Romans allowed them to remove the crucified and to give them a burial prior to sunset. As you know, this is a highly problematic passage in Josephus. I've talked about it at extensive length on my blog about why this is really a difficult passage and it simply isn't straightforward that the Jews did this. It, it's am, it, it is ambiguous. You mean in terms ambiguous. of the same day? I would acknowledge there's some ambiguity there, but then when we have multiple independent sources in Mark and John that talk well, about that's a, That was Jesus. his question. That's his question. But we have to, we have we to have move to on. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Lacona. Um, I was just, because you were talking about how uh, John was the, uh, you think John wrote John. Um, and so I was wondering, I don't know if you guys have ever debated this point before, but Dr. Ehrman wrote one time about how uh, Nicodemus had a conversation with Jesus and... Um, you know, they were talking about being born again. And I think Dr. Ehrman wrote that that conversation couldn't have happened in Aramaic. And so I was just wondering if you've ever, if you've ever discussed that. And if you have, like if you think it was uh, added by a scribe, because if so, then the whole born again thing, if that was just something grafted on later, then that's kind of important, right? So. Yeah, I don't know, I, and I agree with Bart. I, I, I would say that Jesus and Nicodemus would have spoken in Aramaic, especially because it was there in Jerusalem, and it would have been in Aramaic and not in Greek. And he's correct that the term anothen, uh, fr uh, from above or again, that double meaning which is necessary in the story, as Bart rightly points out, is not there in, in, in the Aramaic. So I do think that what John has done here is he has, again, he has recasted uh, this conversation and, and he has played with it some. 
And this is something that both uh, Thucydides and Polybius and Lucian, and I mean, this is well known. I mean, it's without dispute amongst uh, historians of antiquity that you could take speeches and you would take the gist of that speech and then the author is allowed to do what they want with it as long as they are preserving the gist of what is, has been said on that particular occasion by that person, then you're fine in order as the author, the orator, to do with that as you want. So I, I, I think I would differ from Bart only in saying he'd probably go so far as to say Jesus and Nicodemus never had that conversation. The whole thing was invented. I would not go that far. I would say they did have a conversation and we got the gist of that conversation, but that the author of John's Gospel has indeed um, done some stuff. The confusion would only it. have come in Greek, right? Say again. The confusion would have only come in Greek, right? That's kind that, of the that's correct. pivot of the whole. Yeah, and I think yeah, I so just let me, addressed let me that. Just, I mean, yeah, we disagree, we agree and we disagree. But where we disagree is, I, I agree that the entire conversation is predicated on a misunderstanding that is possible only in Greek, but they were speaking Aramaic. So I don't think, I don't think you can say the gist is right, because the gist is this conversation that's built around a confusion. So we, that's another thing we could argue all night about. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ehrman, first of all, I want to say I'm glad to see that you're seeking the truth above all and that you've devoted so much of your life to determine whether those, you know, the Gospels are historically reliable. Um, I question, though, if you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, and I would like you to comment on what you think actually happened in that you had the disciples, first when Christ died, run and was scared, and then all of a sudden they were speaking boldly about what they had saw and what they heard, and they were even willing to go to their deaths um, to, for that claim of who he was. So how, why do you think if this was all pretty much fabricated, uh, you know, over a period of time, how did the early church start with such passion and there was so much, um, uh, I guess, commitment by the early church followers that claimed they actually experienced Christ and yeah, were willing to go to their, excuse me, their death for that. Yeah, great question, thank you. Um, so, um, I talk about this in several of my books. The one I talk about the most is in How Jesus Became God, uh, where I think that what happened is some of the followers of Jesus believed they saw him alive after his crucifixion. They had visions of him. Um, if you're a Christian, then you think they had visions of him because Jesus appeared to them. If you are not a Christian, you think they had hallucinations. They saw something and they were convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. And that's what started it. They convinced other people who convinced other people who convinced other people. Most people who were being convinced, of course, didn't see anything happen. They, they heard the stories about what's happened, just like there are two billion people in the world today none of them who saw the resurrected Jesus, but they, they heard stories about it, and that's what happened in the early church. So I think they saw stories about it. They, they heard stories about it. I don't think we know how many people had visions of Jesus. Um, I don't think uh, that we know, uh, uh, I don't think we do know that they were willing to die for it. We actually don't have, we don't have any uh, traditions about how the disciples died until hundreds, of, uh, over a hundred years later. So this idea that people always say that, you know, they wouldn't die for a lie, they, we don't know how, I mean, how did, the, how did the disciple Andrew die? We have no idea. Bartholomew, how did he die? We have no idea for, for most of these. Uh, we don't even get legends about Peter until the, the second century. So. Um, so what I would say is that they were convinced and is on the basis of visions that they had. And if you're a Christian, it's because you think that they really saw Jesus. Uh, uh, could someone close that back door? There's yeah, noise you. coming in. Yeah, I, I would like to just respond when he says, you know, we don't have anyone that's testifying that they were dying for their, the disciples were dying within until over 100 years later. Well, you've, you've got John who's writing in the 90s, and he mentions the death of Peter, it seems like, in, in chapter 21. But he 21. doesn't say that he was martyred. 
Oh, it does say, yeah, 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 yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's pretty early. You got Clement of Rome writing around the same time, and he talks about the deaths of Peter and Paul. You have Luke in the book of Acts that talks about the death of Stephen and that all these other disciples at least were willing to suffer no, and go to their I'm deaths. I'm saying that we don't know how the 12 disciples died. Paul wasn't one of the 12. Stephen wasn't one of the 12. Peter's the one that's mentioned, and James in the book of Acts. James, the son of Zebedee. That's it. So you, you believe that the whole Christian movement started because some people saw some visions and told others, and it spread? That's, what the, New, that's what the New Testament says. Yeah, that's what happens in the New Testament. You know, the empty tomb doesn't convince anybody in the New Testament. It just makes them confused. It's because they had visions of Jesus. They saw Jesus that they were convinced. And so I think that that's probably right. Some, some, some of the followers of Jesus uh, probably had visions of, visions of him after his death. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for a great debate. My question is, how do you think Jesus viewed his own scriptures, the Hebrew Old Testament? How, as, how did, would you say that again? Oh, how did Jesus himself view his own scriptures as, you know, historical documents? Did he build his faith on them, believing that they were accurate down to the detail? And if so not, you're talking about you think, like how did he view the Old Testament scriptures? Yeah, like the David or something. Did he think that they were some myth, a lot of literary devices, or do you think they were, you know, accurate down to the detail? And if he didn't, why do you think Christians seemingly build their faith on a higher standard than Jesus did? Yeah, well, uh, good question. Um, I I think uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, specifically everything and, and really get it down to split hairs over exactly what Jesus thought about scriptures. But obviously, you know, if we look at motifs throughout the Gospels and, and he relied on the scriptures and quoted them, you know, he quoted them when he was in trouble, he quoted them when he was being tempted, he quoted them when he was on the cross, um, just like many Christians would, you know, when they run into trouble or they get uh, answered the prayer or whatever, they're appealing to the scriptures because they value them. Um, they value them highly. It seems like he believed that they were divinely inspired. I don't know how far we could go past that. He might have believed much more about him than that. I just don't know that we could tell, you know, beyond that what he actually believed. And it seems to me there was another part of your, state, your question that I, I don't remember what it was. Sorry, if he didn't view them as accurate down to the detail, historical documents. Yeah, what let, you know, why do people today, why, why, are, yeah, why do they spread over have a like inerrancy and, and things like mm -hmm. that? I don't know. It's probably because we are a very precise culture with all technology and everything, and biography and history and how to write it has changed over the years. Um, my motto is, whatever view of Scripture is, must be in concert with what we observe in Scripture. And uh, so, period. It's got to be in concert with what we observe in Scripture. And we have to accept Scripture as God has given it to us rather than forcing our idea of modern precision upon it. And if we fail to do it, we may think we have a high view of Scripture when in essence we really have just a high view of our view of Scripture. Um, in your comparison between the two accounts of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, you said in one of them he felt forsaken by the Father um, by crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, but did you consider that Psalms 22 starts out with that, and given that he was a rabbi, um, and or considered a rabbi by um, most people, he, by the end of Psalms 22, is saying how it would be people would be praising God rather than feeling forsaken. Um, why would you come to the conclusion for? Yeah, great question. So the, the, uh, the, the cry of dereliction, as it's called, is often interpreted that way, uh, that, uh, that he's quoting the first part of the psalm, but he wants you to think about the end of the psalm. And so at the end of the psalm, God intervenes and God's on his side, and so he feels confident in God, and he expresses that confidence at the end of the... And I, I don't agree with that reading of it. Um, I, uh, I, of course, I mean, you know, uh, that, that's a common reading of it. I know about the reading, but I think that it misunderstands what Mark is trying to say. Because I think if Mark wanted to say that Jesus was feeling confident in God, he would have quoted a different part of the psalm.
so, uh, Dr. Lycona, uh, my essential problem with the way that you interpret the Bible is that it seems that it allows literally anything, period, to be excused away. I mean, earlier in the debate, I, I can't remember the exact details, but you were asked what it would take to convince you that you were wrong. And there was a, an example, I think, given uh, of um, if it had said that, the, uh, that uh, Jesus had told them in, like, Africa or something, why couldn't, I, why couldn't you, if it had said that, if the Bible said that the conversation took place in Africa, why couldn't you just say, well, that was intended to, uh, to illustrate how far away they were from some particular city? If it said that Jesus rode to the moon on a winged horse, why couldn't you just excuse that away, saying, oh, well, that was intended to just so, show that Jesus was very powerful? What on earth could you ever put in anything using your, your method of interpretation that you couldn't excuse away? Yeah, fair question. Well, first of all, when I said appearance in Africa, it was in relation, you know, why Galilee or Jerusalem, I just said that. If I had a little more chance to think about it, I might have said something a little bit differently. Um, if all of our Roman records, let's say Suetonius and uh, Tacitus and some others, said the prefect of Judea uh, around the year 30, uh, time of Jesus and his crucifixion, was Albinus rather than Pontius Pilate, well, then we might say that something was in error there. Or if we said that uh, Caesar, uh, C instead of Caesar Augustus at that time of Herod the Great, that it was Tiberius Caesar, well, then we'd have a problem there, wouldn't we? Um, some of the Islamic literature has those kind of problems, um, but we don't have that kind of problem. Now, if you want to know, you know, what would it take to disprove some things? Well, I mean, if we discovered an ossuary, a bone box, and it contained the bones of a crucified victim, and there was some papyri inside written in Greek, and it said, we fooled the world until today, and it was signed by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, I'd say, and we could compare that and do a DNA analysis, and, and let's say it matches up with the, sh the blood on the Shroud of Turin, and so we know that these are the bones of Jesus. He didn't rise from the dead. I'd have to give up Christianity. I'd have to say that the resurrection never occurred, and that I've just looked at the evidence and it's led me in a bad direction. Um, so there are a number of things that could convince me I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the thing about Africa is that I think what you would say is that it's been compressed. <laughs> and so, you, and so uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it does seem, I, 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 kinda, I think I agree with the gist of what you're saying. You know, the gist is what matters. And I think the gist of what you're saying, uh, I kind of agree with. I think that, that it'd be very hard to find evidence that would change your mind. But, but you do, agree. well, I, I did acknowledge there are, you know, over a dozen items in the Gospels that have a reasonably good chance of being mistakes. Yeah. But you, you would acknowledge, given what Luke says in Acts, the 40 days, and, and that in Luke 24 he presents everything occurring on Easter Sunday, you would agree that Luke compresses the account in, in the gospel, I, right? I, I, I'm not the one who has a problem with compression. Because okay, I don't either. So what's I know our problem you don't, here? But I, I don't think the accounts are accurate, and you do. But, so, but they're inaccurate in your mind because he compresses. Of course it's inaccurate. Okay, well, I guess that's just a different way of viewing reliability. Uh, do you mind if I ask two questions or just I'm sorry, one? I can't hear you. Just one. Okay. So you said that because the 12 disciples were speaking only Aramaic and they didn't have a lot of knowledge. Shouldn't Paul be the connection between Aramaic and Greek because he is a Roman citizen and he talked to the disciples and they did understand him and they did respond back? So when he did on his mission trips through Acts, the three mission trips, shouldn't he already gotten some Greek followers with Barabbas over in Greece because he did eventually get there? And then he did go to Caesar because he did appeal to Caesar and that would make the connection that oh the Gospels can be written in Greek because of that. I'm, I'm sorry I, I, I got lost in there some are you asking whether the disciples might know might know Greek or not or are you saying that Paul might know Aramaic? I'm saying that isn't Paul the connection between the difference between they can't write in Greek because they don't know Greek and they're not well educated enough to read and write, but yep. Paul 
Yeah, but Paul, Paul wasn't from, uh, from Galilee. Paul's from, he's from some Greek-speaking city outside of Galilee. So he speaks Greek. But yet, shouldn't he be able to speak, like, understand the disciples because there is conversation between we the don't two? Know, we don't know how they communicated, uh, Paul and the, the disciple. I mean, some people think Paul knew Aramaic, but I, I kind of doubt that. And so we don't know how they communicate, whether they had interpreters or we, we just don't know. Okay, my bad. <laughs> um, I was just curious for a specific example, um, how you would deal with some of the things that seem to be discrepancies or differences in an account like the calling of the first disciples where uh, in the synoptic gospels, how there seems to be a set way in all of them of how Jesus did it, where and how, but then in the gospel of John, um, you know, he seems to go about it a completely different route, giving a completely different narrative. Yeah, good question. Um, well, I, the bottom line is we can't get into a time machine, go back and verify any of our hypotheses. So all I can give is an apo- a hypothesis I think is plausible. All right, my guess, if I, I think if we went back, we'd probably see things happen closer to how John has it in the calling of the disciples and that the synoptics have just streamlined things. Right. Our evening, unfortunately, is drawing to a close, but I don't want to let you leave without giving a couple of plugs for our hosting groups. Uh, Please look up and consider joining the KSU History Club. You can go to the Owl Life website, uh, KSU website, or you can go to Facebook and look up KSU History Club. Likewise, Ratio Christi is hosting another event next Wednesday, February 28th, when philosopher Dr. Richard Howe will be giving a talk followed by a Q&A on the topic did the Da Vinci Code get it right? In Social Sciences Building, room 3028 at 7.30 p.m. Everybody, thank you for coming, and let us thank our speakers one final time.